All righty then. All righty then. Hello, hello, hello. My name is Jill Osborne. I am the president and founder of the Interstitial Cystitis Network. It is Sunday, January 10th. It is Sunday, January 10th. Look at that. Now we went live. I started my intro too soon. <laughs> <laughs> Typical. Hello, everybody. My name is Jill Osborne. I am the president and founder of the Interstitial Cystitis Network. We are the largest IC support group in the world at this point in time. I'm the longest serving IC support group leader at 28 years this year in the United States, if not in the world at this point in time. Uh, the purpose of my doing this meeting is to make you so strong, so knowledgeable, so informed that no one can ever mess with you again. I want you to walk in any doctor's office and any family gathering with confidence. I don't want anybody to have the power to minimize you. I don't want anybody to tell you that there's no hope. I don't want anybody to tell you that you are damaged goods because that is simply not true. Hello, Shannon. It's nice to see you. So I do these meetings almost every Sunday, barring fires and other catastrophes, <laughs> as you know. Um, uh, uh, so I do them Sundays. Uh, we generally have three sections to the meeting. Uh, hi, Carolyn. Um, the first part of the meeting is usually something educational for me. The second part of our, and that's usually uh, an hour and a half, 90 minutes. Um, Actually, I usually do a 30 minute lecture or something like that. And then I take an hour's worth of questions. Then we switch over to Zoom. So you can ask your questions to me and get a little bit of coaching. And then we shut Zoom down and we come back. Uh, we are simulcasting live on Facebook and YouTube. And I'm gonna do a sound check. Hope the sound's okay. I was noticing that I was having some issues with my sound settings. Let's see here. Hello, hello, YouTube. Hello, Julianne. Hello, Donna. Oh, Donna, I love you too. Oh my God. You know, like seriously, 2021 is going to be a great year for us. And the reason why it's going to be a great year is because some of the new research that's happening is just nothing short of astonishing. And I'm so incredibly excited. Um, at our last meeting, I showed you guys the latest copy of our magazine, The IC Optimist. Uh, this is a magazine we've been doing now for oh, 17 years, 17 years or so. And my purpose in doing the in doing my uh, this magazine, as well as our website, is I really want you to find something useful within five minutes. I want you to find something that's promising, something that's a valid self-help tip, something that will give you context. And so for those of you who don't know, you know, we have memberships and we have a magazine. The reason why this, I, in my opinion, I think this is the most important magazine I've ever done is because we're now going over why so many patients get IC and IBS um, and vulvodynia. Now, remember, you know, there's still this big tug of war on the Internet with people saying, you know, everybody with IC has chronic infection or, or whatever, whatever. And if there's one thing I really need you to take home from this is that there's variety in the patient community. We cannot make blanket statements about any, anything, any general blanket statements. We cannot do it. Why? Because of the diversity in this patient community. For some of you, IC began in childhood. For others, IC began after menopause. Are you the same? Absolutely not. For some of you, IC began after having a baby or falling on your tailbone, falling down the stairs. Well, for others, I see began after chemotherapy. Are you the same? Absolutely not. And so, um, and some of you, you know, how do we see that more? It's just look in the bladder, okay? Some of you have Hunter's lesions, which we now know are connected to viral infections. While others, myself included, have per perfectly normal bladders. How many times have you gone to the urologist and the urologist says, your bladder looks great. There's nothing wrong. And you're like going, what the hell? I'm in agony here. I'm peeing all night. There has to be something wrong with my bladder. And the answer is, is that sometimes and often more times, the, I, the bladder is a secondary victim of something else that's happening in the pelvis. You could have a fibroid tumor if you're a woman pushing on your bladder. You could have a Tarlov cyst coming off your spinal cord. You could have black mold in your home. 
that's that was something very new that we've learned in the last few years that patients who are exposed to black mold, guess what, have urinary symptoms. You could have um, uh, scar tissue. You know, I mean, if you took a heavy fall, one of my favorite patients is a is a woman named Sue who comes into our Facebook meeting fairly regularly. Here she was diagnosed with IC for 20 years. She did 20 years of bladder therapies. Nothing worked. Nothing worked. And so then she learned about the muscles. And so she started having pelvic floor physical therapy. And what made her very unique is whenever she did the pelvic floor therapy, there was always an area that always hurt always. That's not normal. I see patients usually can't point to a spot. Like if you always have pain on the left side, an inch and a half, an inch and a half to the left of center or to the left of your tailbone, honey, that's not your bladder. That's something else going on. And in her case, as she attended one of our meetings, and one of the things that I keep saying is you are an anatomical mystery to be solved. Please don't walk into a new doctor's office and announce you have IC. For God's sake, don't do that. You need them to study your body. This is the goal here is to get them to look at your body, especially if you're not responding to therapy. The American Urology Association IC guidelines are really crystal clear here. If you're not responding to therapy, if you're getting worse rather than better, if you are continuing to live with intense pain, they instruct the urologist to take a step back and revisit the diagnosis. Why? Because for many of you, your bladder is not the primary problem, it's something else. And in Sue's case, she went and they did either a CAT scan or an MRI of her pelvis. And you know what they found? a giant knot of scar tissue woven through her pelvic floor, really rare location for scar tissue that coincided with her remembering that she'd fallen off a horse really, really badly on that side. A lot of you, if we go back in time, and that's really important here. I mean, listen, you know, generally I always say the past is past and we can't obsess over it. And that's important. We shouldn't be obsessing over it, but sometimes your intuition about what triggered this is really valid and really important. And so if you go back in time, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, ask yourself, what was happening then? Do you remember anything major? Do you remember a trauma? Another patient that I've talked with who actually, I told her story last week and I'm going to tell it again. Um, I adore her, uh, one of the oldest members of the IC network. She got IC symptoms as a teenager. Really bad. Like seriously, seriously bad to the point that she was crying all the time. And of course, doctors and family members were like, well, obviously she's depressed or whatever. They didn't really take her seriously. And it got worse and worse and worse and worse. And by the time she was like 21, 22, she was pretty suicidal. They finally listened to her and opened her up. Her bladder was virtually destroyed it was ruptured and it had been for years because she had been in a car accident. And you can you imagine this teenager with a basically an oozing bladder, oozing urine into her belly, how terrible that must've been. And yet she, like so many other patients was, was categorized as being hysterical and emotional. And listen, that's one of my jobs here. I need you to not walk into a doctor's office and burst into tears. I need you to walk into the doctor's office equal. You pay them. They don't pay you. You are the boss. And it is your job to be able to have a good discussion about what could be happening in your pelvis. And it begins with your knowledge of your anatomy. Let me get this for a moment. You know, I mean, like, seriously, you want to know what drives me absolutely batty as a support group leader? And understand, I've worked with hundreds of thousands of patients. I mean, the IC network um, uh, has worked with anywhere from 50,000 to 200,000 patients a month 
in not more than 90 countries. So we have perspective here. We, we see huge numbers where we're really able to look at trends. But what astonishes me are the patients who come in with zero knowledge of their body. Like they don't even know the names of the structures. Like guys, you have a kidney, you have a ureter that drains urine from the kidney. It ends up in the bladder. And then you have a urethra that leads to the outside of your body. You should know the difference between a ureter and a urethra. And listen, for women, please do not say, it hurts down there. Oh my God. Oh my God. Where? Where does it hurt? Does it hurt by your rectum? Does it hurt by your vulva, on your vulva? Does it hurt by your urethra? Does it hurt by your clitoris? Where does it hurt? Well, you know, it's down there. No, that's not good enough. You have to be able to talk clearly and specifically about what your symptoms are. And if you don't know those structures, for goodness sake, you're all on the internet right now. Google it. Google it. Here's a picture right here, you know? So like, I mean, I, I'm not ranting here. I, 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 believe me, I'm not ranting. I understand. I understand that this is uncomfortable for some people to talk about, but you got to be your own advocate here. You got to be knowledgeable. So look, this is the inside of your body underneath the skin from the bottom up. So for a woman, we have three holes. Can you see this? We have a hole for the rectum that goes, these are th through the levator muscles. We have a hole for the rectum, we have a hole for the vagina, and we have a hole for the urethra. And of course, and we have the labia and the vulva, okay? So it's interesting when I talk with patients, it's like, okay, so you have pain down there. Is it inside of your body or outside of your body? They go, oh, hmm. I'm not sure. And it's like, okay, can you touch it with your finger or is it inside of your body? It's like, oh, okay. Um, I can touch it with my finger. Okay, so that means it's on the outside of your body, correct? She goes, yes. Okay, so now where is it located? Is it by your rectum, by your vulva, on your labia, et cetera? And, there, and, and it's really interesting that when you get specific like that, People really, you really think about it because seriously, if you've got pain on the outside rather than the inside and you've had a, you've had a hysterectomy or you're over the age of 40, then we're really going to be looking at estrogen atrophy, vulvodynia, or we're going to be looking at tight muscles and stuff like that, that could be triggering the vulva. But now let's talk about pain inside the body. So of course I'm wearing, I'm, I'm wearing a dress that doesn't help. But I am wearing leggings. Hmm, how can I do this? So here's your belly button, right? Here, look. Okay, look, I'm gonna show you my fat stomach. I'm a little fat right now, bear with me. So like, look, okay, here's my belly button. Here's my pubic bone, right? Is your pain in a straight line down? Is the pain down here above your pubic bone? Or is your pain to the left or is your pain to the right of center? That's important. That's important. That's one of the things I ask. Is your pain centered or is it to the left of, left of center or right of center? Because again, if it's to the left of center or right to center, we're going to be looking, we're not really going to be looking at the bladder. What does your pain feel like? Is it sharp and electrical? Like you feel like you're being shocked? Or is it dull and achy? It's important. When is your pain the worst? As your bladder is filling with urine and then it's relieved by, by urination? Or does it get worse after you're done peeing? So is it worse before or after you urinate? That's really, really important. Um, what makes it worse? Moving? Sitting, if sitting makes it worse, then you've got a nerve muscle issue going on. If moving makes it worse, again, we're probably looking at muscle. If 
food makes it worse, then we're looking at your bladder wall. But there are also kind of interrelationships there. We have what we call the somatovisceral reflex and the viscerosomatoreflex. reflex. So let's just go back to this here for a moment. So here, let's just rebuild a pelvis. And you know, you have to understand that when you've got pelvic pain, you are going to be incredibly challenging to your, your doctors, especially specialists. Because remember, urologists are trained in the urinary tract. Gynecologists are trained in the reproductive system. Gastroenterologists are, are trained in the, in the bowel and, and et cetera. And they don't, they don't, in medical schools, talk about relationships. And it's all about relationships in the, in the pelvis. And you'll see why in a moment. Okay, so, so let's look at this for a moment. So here, here is a pelvis from the front. And look, here's your pubic bone, right? So there's your pubic bone. And your bladder is gonna be basically right above your pubic bone right here. And you'll see now, the first thing you understand about the pelvis is it has the largest bones in the human body, the hip bones. The bigger the bone, the more weight it's meant to carry, right? So there we go. We got giant bones. We have got the sacrum down here and everywhere you see a hole in the sacrum, nerves come out. And these are nerves that go down your legs and they merge together and they, and they, they split apart and they innervate everything from how you walk to if you have an orgasm. And of course we have muscles. We have the pelvic floor muscles because these are the muscles that help you move. These are the muscles that help you move your, your knee in and out. These are the muscles that compensate when you're, when you're walking. And basically you've got giant muscles that go from your abdomen down into your pelvis that are not shown here. And you've also got muscles from your legs that also connect to here. So the pelvis is basically the center of the human body. It's the core of the human body. And of course, one of the challenges here is that if you have a muscle injury, as many of you do, myself included, Y'all can't see it from the outside unless you're walking weird. If you're walking weird, then yeah, maybe we're going to be able to see that something is something fundamentally is going on. But when you got a muscle injury on the inside, you can't necessarily feel it. Um, and generally, when a doctor does a physical exam, when they put their finger in your vagina or your rectum, they're going to be touching muscles. See how easy it is? Look at how easy it is to touch these muscles. And that's important. We're going to come back to that. Now let's rebuild this pelvis. So the first thing we're going to do with this pelvis, and this is going to be for a one, is let's just go ahead and put, oh wait, hold on. Got to put the, got to put the levators on because the levators connect everything. Okay. So now I put the outer layer of muscles on, but let's go back here now to the inside. So the first, first thing we're going to do, and you can see the holes. Can you see the holes down here? Right is let's go ahead and put in the uterus. Hold on, backwards. All right, the uterus has arrived. Woohoo! <laughs> okay, the next thing we're gonna put in is the bladder. And look, you can see the urethra hole right there, right? See the urethra hole down there? All right, the bladder has arrived. It should be kind of deeper in there. It doesn't normally stick out quite that much, but there you go. There's the bladder. And okay, my, my ovary is weird. All right, now we're gonna put in the rectum. I mean the bowel down to the rectum. All right, it has arrived basically, right? It's not quite in the right position, but do you see how close everything here is in, in this area? This is a small, confined space. And interwoven among all of these, of course, is blood vessels and nerves. And so we can understand then, if you have a fibroid tumor here, of course that's gonna push against the bladder and potentially cause issues. If you've got endometriosis, you can see how easily it's gonna to be to wrap around some of these structures. If you have a Tarlov cyst back here or on the inside, 
that is bulging out and pressing on a nerve that supports one of these areas, that makes sense that that's going to be a problem. Uh, Dr. Jerome Weiss, in his fabulous book, Breaking Through Chronic Pelvic Pain, talks about two important reflexes. Now, y'all know what a reflex is. A reflex is when they take a little hammer and they hit your knee, below your knee, and your leg pops up, right? Reflexes are a critical part of, of human survival. So in the pelvis, we have two important reflexes. We have the viscerosomatic reflex. Viscero stands for viscera, like your bladder. Somatic stands for muscles. So with the viscerosomatic reflex, the question is, can organs change muscle behavior? And the answer is, well, yeah, definitely. If you're in pain, your, your muscles are gonna get tight to protect you from that pain. That's subconscious. Y'all can't do a damn thing about that. That is what happens. If you're under stress, your muscles are going to get tight. You can't do a damn thing about that. That is part of survival. So we know that people who have been in long-term pain are going to have tight muscles as a response to that pain. So consider the patient whose symptoms began because y'all spent 20 years drinking diet soda or you went through chemotherapy, or you took ketamine. The bladder wall has a chemical injury, and then God forbid you're continuing to pour that chemical irritant on the bladder wall. It's throbbing and pain and pain and pain, and the muscles get tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. And before you know it, you can't pee and you can't have sex and you can't have a normal bowel movement because your muscles are so freaking tight. Our therapeutic priority for that chemical injury patient is to calm and soothe the bladder. We're gonna get rid of the chemical irritant and hope that the muscles will relax as the pain reduces. Although if it's been, if it's been happening for a long time, bam, you're probably gonna need muscle therapy too. Okay, logical, that makes sense, right? But let's talk about the opposite reflex, the somatovisceral reflex. Can a muscle change organ behavior? I mean, really, like seriously, can, if you see these muscles on the outside, can these muscles change and influence the way the bladder is working? And the answer is absolutely. Because guess what? If your muscles are tight, you've got ischemia. You know what that is? Oxygen deprivation because your muscles are squeezing your blood vessels and you don't have good blood supply. It's very hard for the bladder to be healthy if you do not have good blood supply. If your symptoms began after a fall, let's say you fell on your butt, or let's think about Stu who fell off her horse. She went, bam. So all of her weight landed. Let's just say, I'm not saying, I don't know exactly what her fall was, but let's just say she landed on her left glute. So, 100, 125 pounds or 140 pounds landed on an area of skin this big, right? The muscles are squeezed. They're compressed. The blood vessels are squeezed. And we know blood vessels get broken because that's what causes a bruise, right? You all have bruises. That, that's because muscles are, I mean, uh, blood vessels are broken. When you suffer a compression injury, the other thing that happens is the little tiny blood vessels inside the nerve fibers also break. Now a nerve fiber is a tube and it's basically an, a, another pressure injury because if that little blood vessel is broken, now we've got a nerve that simply cannot function normally. Nerves need blood supply to function. When a nerve is functioning, it releases calcium into the blood, blood uh, stream and then it immediately pulls it back out. So for you to be healthy, you gotta have good blood supply. Now, unfortunately, the, the, the longer the ischemia, the greater the damage in, in essence, the greater, the, uh, the more challenging it is for those tissues to be healthy. But damaged irritated nerves are a whole nother story because what happens is when they get irritated, they release caustic substances called substance P. Substance P. And substance P damages tissue. 
So can an or can a muscle change the bladder wall? Yes. If the muscle injury and the muscles are tight and the and the nerves are damaged and the blood flow is damaged, you can darn well bet eventually the bladder wall is not going to have what it needs to be healthy and it's probably going to have some substance P in there. Now, for this patient, you have no freaking clue that you have a muscle injury. Your first symptom is frequency urgency. You call the doctor. Hey, doc, I got a UTI. Doctor goes, okay, well, let's do some antibiotics. You do the antibiotics. They might work. They might not work. If they work right away, it usually means it's a tiny, it's a tiny injury. But if they don't work and you go back to the doctor and say, hey, doc, man, I'm still, I can't sleep through the night. I am peeing. And the doctor goes, well, let's do a different, let's do a different antibiotic. It still doesn't work. You could, some of you have been on antibiotics for 10 years. And then symptoms keep coming back. And then at some point in time, the doctor goes, you know what, man, I think it's all in your head. Man, you need emotional help, mental help. And, you know, hold yourself back from slugging the doctor who says that. It's disgraceful. Though we all can use help coping, but that's certainly not the cause of this. And then at some point in time, a doctor says, oh, okay, you've got frequency urgency. We don't know why. You might have overactive bladder. They give you overactive bladder meds, ditropan, detrol. They don't work. Three months later, six months later, a year later, you go back to the doctor. The doctor goes, man, I hate to break it to you, but I think you've got IC. It's a terrible thing. You're going to hate it. You're, you know, it's incurable. Da, 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 da. You walk out of that office with the diet and maybe a prescription for Elmeron. Devastated. You come onto the internet and you read horrible patient stories and oh my God, life is over. But you, but you know, you're diligent. You follow the diet. You do the Elmeron, but you're not really getting better. Why? Why? Because for the muscle injury patient, our therapeutic priority is to restore blood flow. Any good top tier urologist now should be at the very first appointment doing a pelvic floor assessment. They need to stick their finger up the you know what. And if your muscles are tight, you are to be referred to pelvic floor physical therapy immediately. Immediately. What we knew in 2008 when the first pelvic floor myofascial massage therapy was released by our own National Institutes of Health, the pelvic floor physical therapy outperformed bladder therapy two to one. And when that happened at that moment, the icy world was turned on its head because up to that point, everybody's going, this is a bladder disease. Well, guess what? For some of you, it's not. For some of you, it's injury. For some of you, it's trauma. And that is why we do subtyping now. That is why we do subtitling. But get back to my original point here. One of the things that drives me crazy about the internet is that there are people who just keep saying, you have infection, you have infection, you have infection. It's a fastidious infection. It's a biofilm infection. Go back to when your symptoms began. Do you remember trauma? Do you remember falling? I was working with a guy this week, really interesting guy this week who has had symptoms for, uh, I don't know, like 10 years, maybe, maybe 15 years, 20 years. And they got really bad after COVID, like really bad after COVID. He was at home. He was feeling, you know, as we all have been feeling, you, man, you want to, you just being home sucks sometimes. You want to get out and walk. Well, he loved to ride a bike. And so he tripled his time on his bike and his symptoms got much, 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 much worse. And trying therapies, trying supplements, nothing really working. Um, and then we had a nice discussion and it's like, all right, let's talk about your symptoms and tell me what you're doing. And so really spending two, two hours a day on, on a bicycle over the age of 60 is way, 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 way too much. And if you think about it this way, think about, so here it is from the bottom up, right? Here it is from the bottom up. Where is that bicycle seat pushing? That bicycle seat is pushing the levator in. It is pushing against the nerves. And so in his case, I am 100% sure, and they had already told him he had tight muscles, that his flare was because of all this extraneous bike riding that he'd been doing. 
And what was even more interesting is we went back to when his symptoms began. Like, okay, well, let's go back 20 years ago. So what was happening back then? He was riding a bicycle massively. He loves riding bikes. But unfortunately, bike rider syndrome is real. And you can see what happens over time if you keep pushing in on these structures. There's going to be issues. So um, you've got to understand the structures. You've got to understand the anatomy so that when you walk into the doctor's office, you can have a good, meaningful discussion. One of the things that I say is, as to, to women is, what's the health of your skin down there? Are you dry? Because if your vulva is dry and your vagina is dry, so is your urethra and so is your bladder because they're all mucous membrane organs. So we have a condition called the genitourinary syndrome of menopause. This is the patient whose symptoms began after a hysterectomy or as they've gotten older. It's not a disease. There's no disease happening there. This is estrogen atrophy. You know, you're, think about the bladder for a moment. The bladder is the only organ in the human body designed to hold toxic waste because urine is body waste. Urine contains ammonia and urea and all sorts of irritants. So how, does, how can the bladder hold that for hours at a time and not get damaged? And the answer is that your bladder is like your mouth. It is a hollow organ covered with a really thick coating of mucus. We call it the mighty mucus. And the purpose of that mu mucus is to protect you. It is a barrier. It prevents the irritants in urine from reaching your bladder cells. And it also prevents bacteria and other infectious um, organisms from more easily infecting those cells. Unfortunately, it's estrogen dependent. So when you're young and you have lots of estrogen, guess what? You have a lot of mucus, you are gold. But as you get older, you have less estrogen and you have less mucus. That's not a disease, that's aging. Your bladder's ability to defend itself is now compromised. It's compromised. And so you might have been able to enjoy coffee or tea in your 30s and 40s, but all of a sudden in your 50s, holy crap, your bladder's starting to scream at you because of the damn one cup of coffee a day you're having in the morning or the one cup of tea you're having in the morning, you know, and you're not understanding that it's about um, uh, the quality and health of your skin. You could be doing Elevil, all that sort of stuff, but ultimately in the end, one of the most important things you can do if you are dry is just using topical estrogen. When you use topical estrogen, your skin starts to produce mucus. A lot of people think, that a treatment will heal them. No, it doesn't work that way. No treatment can physically heal your bladder or your muscles. You have to create an environment that will support those tissues repairing themselves and healing themselves. So again, if you've got a bladder wall injury, for God's sake, don't be pouring acid on the wound every day. That's just idiotic. If you have got estrogen atrophy, one of the best things you can do is just give that skin just a wee bit of, mu of estrogen because it will immediately start producing more mucus. And those are the patients that would also benefit from a coating effect, right? Because ultimately, and then if you're 70 years old, six years old, and you're doing estrogen, you'll never have a bladder of a 20 year old. It's, you know, and, and so that's why diet matters, but that's when doing a chondroitin based supplement would be viable. And that's what the American Urology Association says. The American Urology Association says in step one, they want you to try some supplements first because supplements don't have the side effects that traditional medications do like Elmeron. And it makes me really angry now that you th we've had patients who have been on Elmeron for 20 years, but their bladders have been healthy all this time. It was never their bladder in the first place. It was their muscles for some of them. So let's get those supplements so that you can at least see what they are. Let's see here. So just so you have an understanding of what's out there. Let's 
So the chondroit now, why do we say chondroitin? Why do we say chondroitin? Well, we had a research study released last year at the Euro European Society for the Study of IC, which showed that it was chondroitin that helped to restore the superficial integrity of the bladder wall. Now they were specifically talking about bladder installations that valued chondroitin as being more effective than heparin in a bladder installation. But we're kind of translating that to potentially orals also, oral supplements also. And so the chondroitin-based supplements are going to be bladder builder, Cystoprotect. Cystoprotect was created by federally funded IC researcher, uh, Dr. Theo Harris Theo Harides at Tufts University 20 years ago. Tens of thousands of patients have used Cystoprotect. Bladder rest, Cystomend, and Cisto Renew. Now, why does the AUA put put supplement? Now, of course, they don't they don't do brand names. Of course, uh, they would never do that in their guidelines. They're not allowed to do that. But these are the core supplements. Um, the other supplement that has a bit of a coating effect or a soothing effect is aloe, and so aloe path. There's desert harvest aloe, and then there's aloe path. And the reason why. Um, uh, I think allopath is more viable at this point in time is because it also has a pain fighting effect to it with the ingredient PEA. So, you know, we have options now, but even more of that, for God's sake, have a pelvic floor assessment. So many of you have never had that done. If you're not responding to bladder therapies, take a step back. Let's rule something out. Let's rule as many things out as we can. You know, again, it's going to be pelvic floor injury, fibroid tumors, endometriosis. I got a whole list over on our website, icnetwork.org. There's a whole section on confusable conditions that should all be ruled out. Okay. So, man, you know, anyway, my point here is learn about it, be informed, understand your anatomy. Let's go back to some of your questions here for a moment. Let me just go over to uh, YouTube for a moment. Um, hey, guys, on YouTube, y'all are talking about boric acid, not borax acid, boric acid. Borax and boric acid is very different. Boric acid um, uh, suppositories are often used um uh, for people who have candida infections, they're vaginal, um, and they, um, I've used them, I used them when I had a pretty bad two years worth of candida infections. They usually don't hurt, they're just creating a more acidic environment, which makes it harder for bacteria to thrive, right? So if you've got um, vaginite, bacterial vaginitis, which is very common in older people. So anyway, just to correct that, that's boric acid. Denise says, my question is I'm postmenopausal and have a difficulty with antibiotics and yeast infections. Um, what do you know about inserting boric acid? So, you know, again, all it's going to do is acidify the environment, which makes it a little bit harder for bacteria to survive and candida to survive. Um, Julianne says, I'm sitting in a car on a four hour drive back home. My bladder, my pelvic floor is killing me. All right, Julianne. So, what can we do for you? Well, number one, if you can stop every hour and get up and walk around a little bit, that would be very useful and very important. We got to just try to loosen things up a little bit. Uh, if you've got, a, you know, the challenge with sitting is that it's, you know, your, I, I mean, your, your pelvis is open to whatever forces and stressors are coming up from the street. And that's why many patients really struggle with cars that have really bad suspensions is because you're like doing this. It's like biting a right. I mean, riding a bike and bouncing. Think about what that does to your pelvic, to your pelvic floor and all that other stuff down there. So um, if you, if you have a muscle relaxant, if you happen to have Flexeril, that might be helpful during the drive. I, whenever, as long as you're not driving, if you've got Baclofen, which does not have a sedating effect, so I'm pretty sure you can drive with Baclofen, but you certainly can't with Flexeril or Vistril. You could try Azo Bladder Pain Relief Tablets. I mean, drop by a local uh, a drugstore. Maybe you can find this. So bladder pain relief tablets, which will kind of numb your bladder wall. 
drink water. Don't don't stop at Jack in the Box or Taco Bell and get any crazy food right now, man. We just got to get you through this drive. You can do it if you need to. Lay down on the back seat. If you've got a heating pad, like a body heat heating pad, uh, put that on your pelvis and uh, grit your teeth. You got a four hour drive, but you'll get there. It's not going to be fun, but you'll get there. Uh, try some, uh, you know, hey, listen, the other thing you want to do is do distraction here. Listen, one of the great things about driving in a car, especially if you've got other people with you, is do I spy? You know, play some games. Uh, if you've got a cell phone, put on a funny audio tape. Uh, I listen to audio tapes all of the time. Do something distracting. So, you know, play the license plate game where, okay, there's one from Michigan. There's one from California. See who can find the most that. Or if you've got kids with you, see if they can identify, you know, funny things like, I can see a barn. Can anybody see a barn? Or I can see a police car. Can anybody see that? Just get busy. You know, your brain. So understand that your, your brain will intensify pain that is accompanied by anxiety and stress. So we got to break that while you're on the car ride. Because uh, pain that is accompanied by laughter is minimized by the brain. So I would be doing a lot of distraction right now. Put on your favorite music. Sing as loud as you can. Because that, too, will make different parts of your brain work that will, uh, again, try to minimize that pain. Okay? So let's get some laughter in there. Let's get some games in there. Let's get some music in there. You might find it helpful you know, to just play, try, play with your position a little bit, you know, you might just need to move around. I mean, they generally don't want you to sit with your legs crossed when you got pelvic floor, if you got SI issues, but you might find it helpful to kind of tilt your pelvis a little bit this way, that way, just try to keep, keep moving just a little bit gently, gently, gently. Okay. Nancy says, I power walk now and my hip is injured. Going to the physical therapist. Can this cause a burning feeling in my vaginal area? It sure can. We just had a research study released uh, this summer, which found that 70% of the men with prostate pain had an underlying hip issue. And so, yeah, you know, I mean, if you have a hip that isn't, whoops, uh -oh. my levators just fell. So let's think about walking here for a moment. Walk, 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 right, right? So here's you walking. But what if you're limping? You got a little one and then a one. Oh, 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 right? That's what happens when you limp. And think about how that's contorting those muscles down there. You know, and, and so, um, yeah, you got to get that checked out for me. It's my, you know, I think y'all know that I uh, ruptured uh, two discs in my back in uh, November. Didn't figure that out until December, but I feel them right now. And, um, uh, for me, it's really sitting for an extended period of time that really nips it in the bud. Also, uh, another really interesting thing, guy, for, for women out there it, and for men too, uh, but for women specifically, um, is pins and needles. If you ever feel a pins and needles sensation in your skin, like on your vulva, on your labia, around your rectum, your perineum, et cetera, et cetera, that can be pudental neuralgia. That can be muscles so tight they're, they're squeezing the pudental nerve. And again, this is the nerves that come out of the sacrum here. They come out of the sacrum here and then they merge into one nerve and then they go through a structure called the Alcox Canal and then they split up again and they innervate all the structures in here. And so, you know, pins and needles is important. That's one of the things that Dr. Jerome Weiss, again, one of our national pelvic pain experts, uh, he always takes time. He always took time to really look at the health of the skin to see if there was anything funky going on there. All righty. All right, Facebook. Now, you guys on Facebook here, you can see I'm about 24 minutes behind on your questions. And Facebook does not let me scroll back. Let me try. So if you asked a question on Facebook and I missed it, please ask it again. Do not take it personally. I just have a lot of things coming at me. 
and and most streamers have a computer over here and a computer over here and a computer up there so that they can see it all. But I'm only working on one computer, so it's a little bit hard. Angela said, I had a bladder sling that fixed my bladder after hysterectomy now that and that started my IC journey, but now I have a prolapse. That's not unusual, hun. That's not unusual, especially if you're straining as you get older, the loss of estrogen results in weaker muscles. And so you you muscles will absolutely become will change over time but you guys ponder too are you straining to pee are you straining to have a bowel movement if you are your muscles are jacked up you're not supposed to strain when you're pushing you're tightening muscles period end of story that's not normal we have to fix that irene says i have pain in my bladder when i lay on my stomach is that muscles <sighs> Probably. Um, I, you know, I, I, I'm having trouble visualizing that. When my IC was absolutely at its worst back in uh, when I was in my early 30s, I used to sleep on my stomach with my ankles in the air. Now, can you imagine that? I'm sleeping on my stomach with my ankles over my butt. I even came out of surgery. I had a laparoscopy to rule out cancer. And that night, I slept on a wound because that's what felt the best to me. And ironically, what do we know about my case? What we know about my case is mine was never really my bladder wall. It was my pelvic floor. And by moving, by rotating my pelvis into the uh, mattress, I relieved stress and pressure on some of those muscles. Yeah, I had a bladder wall injury too, but that's long healed. But underneath it all, there were muscle issues. Uh, let's see, Angela says her hysterectomy cut through the vaginal wall. And instead of taking it out, he just cut out the part that was cutting. Girl, I'd love to hear more about that. Mary says, can endometriosis in your younger years continue to be a source of pain postmenopausally? Here we go. Mary, question of the day. So um, there is a group of patients, as they get older, they have more pain conditions. You might have uh, painful periods when you're a teenager. And then in your 20s, they go, oh, man, you got endometriosis. And they might even do a hysterectomy. They do, they do laparotomies to remove the hysterectomy. And then one day, bam, bam, you have bowel issues. And then you got vulvodynia. And, and it's like every couple of years, you get a new pain condition. Um, and we now know why that happens. We know why that happens. And it's very, very, very exciting. And it is what this issue of our IC Optimist is dedicated to. Chronic overlapping pain conditions. If you've got IC and one other pain condition, vulvodynia, IBS, and again, man or woman, if you've got IC, IBS, uh, TMJ, which mine is acting up on my left side quite a bit, um, fibromyalgia, chronic headaches. You are a chronic overlapping pain condition uh, patient. So what the hell is that? I mean, like, seriously, what the hell is that? I'm a chronic overlapping pain condition. I had my first frequency urgency in seventh grade. I had ovarian, let's say I had, I had vulvodynia, quote unquote, yeast infections in high school. I threw ovarian cysts in college. I got IBS in my early 20s. I got migraines in my mid 20s. And by my early 30s, the bladder pain started. And you know, when you're in that, when you're in that cycle, you're like going, what the hell is wrong with me? Oh, Brenda says, I just found out I have a mild form of spina bifida in my lower vertebrae. Could that cause my pelvic pain? I've been trying to remember back to any injuries. Uh, but when you found out that, it's like, aha. Yeah, that's a pretty huge aha moment, right? Okay, so what creates the foundation for all of these escalating pain conditions? It's your central nervous system. So, um, about 15 years ago, all the patient organizations that worked with all of these different conditions got together and formed the Chronic Pain Research Alliance. 
and they funded the Chronic Pain Research Alliance. And it's actually run by the TMJ Association. And that research group is stunningly successful. And they were the first ones who showed that brain scans are different in patients with chronic overlapping pain condition. Now, don't freak out. I'm going to explain it. Um, um, and and I, I will, I've been watching these brain studies now for eight or nine years, and I never really talked about them a lot because I didn't really understand them and I didn't really want to scare you, but now I get it. Now we understand it. And that's because I went to a conference this uh, fall or I watched a conference this fall. So somebody with, chron with chronic overlapping pain conditions, when we look at your brain, your brain is stuck in fight or flight. So, you know, the fight or flight reflex, like, the, you know, if you walked out of your front door and there was saber tooth tiger across the street, you're going to go, whoa. And what you don't know is that your brain, your sympathetic nervous system immediately turns on to protect you. It drives the fight or flight response. The amygdala in your brain does that. So what does that mean? What that means is that your muscles get tight, your blood pressure increases, your heart rate increases because your brain thinks your life is at, at, uh, at stake. And this is to prepare you to fight for your life or run for your life. But after the saber tooth tiger has disappeared, the parasympathetic takes over, nervous system takes over and that's what calms everything down. It lowers your heart rate. It lowers your blood pressure. It releases your muscles. But people with chronic overlapping pain conditions, you're stuck in fight or flight. We are stuck in fight or flight. And our brain scans show it. And this was supported by our own IC research from the National Institutes of Health. It also found exactly the same thing. So I am in this group. So, so the best part of this International Pelvic Pain Conference was a class that talked about risk factors, specifically pediatric risk factors. And what they found is that within the year before the symptoms began, there was a physical trauma, breaking a leg, a bad fall, falling on your butt. There was an original trauma that was pretty significant to the body. But they also found that there is also a group of patients who suffered emotional trauma. They were abused or uh, they were bullied. And I, I want you to, and in fact, ironically, over on my other computer here, I, the next article I'm writing for my, for my website, let me, let me just get it here for a moment because I think you'll find it very, 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 very interesting. Hold on. Okay, so here we go. We have a study that just came out, adverse childhood experiences in women with overactive bladder or IC bladder pain syndrome. Okay, now this is, and this is from the University of New Mexico. Now we've known this for years now, guys. We've known about some of the adverse childhood events. Um, and it makes sense within the context of chronic overlapping pain conditions. And the best example I can give you is I want you to think about somebody who brings home a new puppy. And that dog is so freaking happy. Man, that tail is wagging. This is a joyful, happy dog running to everybody, happy, barking, lean everybody. But there's somebody in the house who, when you, when you aren't looking, kicks it. And that little puppy's going, what? And he yelps and he kind of turns around and he runs around. But then everybody else is super nice. So the puppy is wagging its tail, happy, 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 happy. And gets kicked again. And y'all can't see it because the abuser is in another room. That's happened twice to that puppy. The, pu the puppy comes out of that room and that tail's between its legs. And if that keeps happening every day, every day, every day, after literally after two weeks, their entire brain has changed. That's what that's what they say. I think it, I think it's twenty days of abuse. Can you can see notable noticeable differences in brain structures, and in twenty days of of joy, we see healing of the brain.
But let's get back to that puppy. Every day it's being kicked. Once or twice, three, four times a day. Before you know it, that puppy's quivering in the corner. And you're all going, oh my, what's wrong with the dog? No clue that the dog is literally being, being abused. Think about a child who's living in that environment. Think about a child who's being abused. They're happy, 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 happy until uh, the uncle comes into the house. Fight or flight. Fight or flight. Their brain turns on. That is their saber tooth tiger. But if they face that every single day, they are in fight or flight every single day. And it becomes a pattern. It becomes a real pattern. Now, so this is called nervous system wind up. The system is wound up. And it's because we have a massive amount of adrenaline flowing through our body that is triggering a lot of irritation. And that brain is just, remember your brain is so interesting because it's always trying to establish contacts. Whatever you go through, like it remembers everything. And so your brain is really trying to protect you. Your brain is really trying to get you through this dark moment. But there's a lot of processing that happens. There's a lot of different things that happen in your brain. And it's just the great unknown is, is how our brain works. But this is what we do know, is that consistently with somebody with chronic overlapping pain conditions, your brain is stuck in fight or flight. And how do we know it? Really, honestly, by your anxiety level. If, uh, if the world is a happy place for you and filled with opportunity and yeah, you're, bl you're going through a weird thing with your bladder, but you are in good shape, you are fighting every day, your, your central nervous system is not wound up. Your brain is not wound up. But if you're going, I don't know if I'll ever get better. Nobody's helping me. I'm scared for my future. That is a sign that your central nervous system is starting to get wound up. And if you're in that place where the world is empty and dark and lonely, and you are literally in a dark room, that tells us that your central nervous system has been wound up for a long time, a long time. The great news here is that the brain responds beautifully to therapy. It's physical therapy for the brain. And nobody is saying that this is a mental illness. What they're saying is that this is, thank you, Angie. Angie says, I've been to, haven't been to the group in forever, have missed you, and back to dry needling for your tight pelvic floor. Excellent. Good job. You got to do it. Okay. So if you, let's just do a reality check here. <laughs> Wave your hand. Are you living with anxiety every day? Y'all know you have negative thoughts every day. It's like, oh, why should I even go to the doctor? It's never going to help me. Oh, my God. Why would I go out with my friends? I'm going to have to pee all the time. No, I don't want to get on a plane and go anywhere. No, no, I want to stay home. It's all about the bathroom. I need to be close to the bathroom. No, I'm not going to go to the doctor. They're going to hurt me. No, I'm not going to try that treatment. Nothing's ever worked for me. It's hopeless. I'm a lost cause. Oh, Screw that. No, you're not a lost cause. That's your brain stuck in fight or flight. So how do we get it out of fight or flight? It's pretty easy. And this whole conference was dedicated to this. And you can get this magazine. If you're already a member, you can download it from your member page. So this is where it gets really fun. Because again, when you think about your brain, it's like a thunderstorm. It's like, bow, 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 bow. All sorts of different areas of your brain are light, lighting up just throughout the day. It's not a straight line. I mean, your brain works like a little burst of energy all, all throughout your head. Um, if we get your brain focusing on the five senses, you are forcing your brain, you're forcing your sympathetic nervous system off and you're turning your sympathetic nervous system on. It's exciting. It's easy. You just have to do it. I was doing it. I was doing it in the shower this morning. So how do we do it? Well, there's one technique called I spy. So let's just do I spy for a moment. And again, our purpose here is to turn off the sympathetic nervous system, turn on the parasympathetic nervous system and get your brain out of fight or flight so that your pain is not so intense. So here we go. Here we go. Uh, I spy. 
what do you see? Just look at something. For me, I've got a beautiful blast structure of a dragonfly on my window. So I'm just gonna look at that for a moment. Blue wings, take a deep breath in, out. What do you hear? Can you hear anything? I can hear my ears ringing. It was Christmas Carol. Usually there's music in the background. Okay, so what do you hear? Okay, in, out. Okay, what do you smell? Can you smell anything right now for me? Here you go, mint tea. Mm. Okay, in, out. What are you touching? Touch something that has a texture. For me, it's gonna be my top because I like really smooth things. Just touch that. In, out. Okay, so here we are. We are telling the brain or we're forcing the brain to pay attention to all of the information it uses to process what's going on. So we're hammering the brain with sensation. Let's do it again. What could you look at that would put a smile on your face? Hmm. Yeah, there's so many things. Um, a monarch butterfly going through the flying through the garden. Okay, in, out. What could you hear that would put a smile on your face? Is it a child's laughter, a dog barking, a cat meowing, purring? In, out. What could you smell that would put a smile on your face? Lavender, in, out. What could you touch that would put a smile on your face? A, a warm cat fur. In, out. You see, so what we're doing is we're getting the brain involved, doing puzzles, listening to music, reading books, reading hard books. That's important. I want to get her to Jenny. Jenny says, I, I took Elmer on. It didn't work. This is the second inner stim I've had. I can't I just can't get it working like the other one. This one is much smaller than the one I used to have that was the size of a hockey puck. I've had installations and bladder distensions, everything else you can think of. Now it's Botox. So Jenny, <clears throat> remember that you are an anatomical mystery to be solved. If all of those therapies aren't working for you, it's time to take a, take a step back and revisit the diagnosis. Did we miss something? What's it? Because what you haven't said is what's going on with your pelvic floor. I'd like to know that. Mary says, all I have is burning. Why and how do I deal with that? Mary, where is the burning? Where is it? It's the inside of your body or outside of your body. Is it If it's in your urethra or on your skin, it's probably estrogen atrophy. Mary says, can endometriosis affect postmenopausal women? The answer is yes, because if your endometriosis is really bad, you, pro you could have adhesions on your bladder wall, on, on the outside of your bladder or, or wrapped around structures down there. And so even though they're not getting the estrogen that would drive the endometriosis to grow, if you have endometrial adhesions that are interfering with blood supply and or even going through your bladder wall, it's, it certainly could affect you postmenopausally. Pam says, I find standing on my feet for long periods of time. Uh, creates pain just left and above the pubic bone. I've had IC for about 15 years and I've had four installations. Last, last one a month ago where they found a few lesions in the bladder. Well, so Pam, it's all about the spot. You have pain to the left of center above the pubic bone. So is that where the hunter's lesion is? If it's a lesion, is that where that is? Or do you have a endometrial adhesion there? Or do you have a muscle trigger point there? The odds are you could have a trigger point there. Did they say what kind of lesions they found in the bladder are? Lauren says, I do Botox every nine months. They have worked better for me than anything else. So, so Lauren, think about this for a moment. Botox works by silencing nerves. It silences nerves. 
So that tells us that you're neurologically driven, that you've got nerve issues. So if you've got other pain conditions, you also should be focusing on your central nervous system. We have to calm that central nervous system down. You know, in the research with post uh, with chronic overlapping pain conditions, what they found was that quote unquote therapy, like cognitive behavioral therapy, did not work because it doesn't heal the nerves. You have to do things that will heal the nerves too, which is mind body medicine. Lauren says, they told me I didn't have endo and I, I, I wound up having a hysterectomy. And when they did that, they went, wound up taking out a crap load of endo. Wow, girl. Well, at least they found it. I mean, it would have been a tragedy if they'd done the hysterectomy and there was nothing wrong. And we had a, a young woman who was like 23 and they did that and they removed a perfectly healthy uterus and she won a million dollars from uh, the hospital for doing that because the surgeon, the gynecologist ignored the urologist. Lisi says, overlapping, that would be me. Dargay says, I see no longer called this term. It's called painful bladder syndrome. Actually, it's not even called that anymore. So um, back 20 years ago, it was interstitial cystitis. And then what happened is the European researchers split from the Americans because the Americans at that time were really arrogant. I mean, American researchers 20 years ago in the IC world were like, we know everything, you know nothing, just believe us. And the European IC researchers just had it. And so they split and they created their own group called the European Society for the Study of IC. Um, and they were the ones who started using painful bladder syndrome because they wanted it to match up with other pain syndromes. Um, uh, and so they came back to the United States a couple of years later and they said, guys, interstitial cystitis is the wrong word. We, we all know that. Let's call it painful bladder syndrome. But then they changed their mind and they switched it and they switched it over to bladder pain syndrome. Um, and in Asia, in Japan and Asia, they don't use either one of those. They call it hypersensitive bladder syndrome. Dar says, painful bladder syndrome has a root cause. Please do your research. Uh, girl, I've been doing my research for 28 years. Uh, so uh, uh, I'd love to hear what you think the cause is. Uh, we're now also working with some B12 uh, uh, um processing disorders in some patients. Um, and that is now supported from three different sources, three independent sources that some, some patients have a uh, B12 processing disorder, which is connected then to driving the endometriosis and the polycystic ovarian syndrome, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, there's no one root cause. Like seriously, when I started this, that's that's the whole point there. We're not making blanket statements about everybody here. There's ver diversity in this patient population. Angela says, why don't many doctors recognize the overlapping pain issues? Some make you feel like you're a hypochondriac. Angela, because it's very new. I mean, the chronic over the chronic pain research alliance has only been active for about 10 years. Um, and that's where we become educators. We become educators, right? And that's why I spent two months doing this article. It's the large, longest article I've ever done for the IC network um, on explaining the mechanism of action with these brain studies and with the different areas of the brain that are involved. Kayla says, can endometriosis cause urgency frequency? Yes, it can. Absolutely. Endometriosis can attach to the bladder wall. It can actually tunnel through the bladder wall and emerge directly inside your bladder. Lauren says, I have IBS, chronic cystitis, and my chronic cysts on my ovaries, diverticulitis, chronic IC, chronic migraines, chronic kidney stones. Now they say the gastroparesis is connected to IC. Hun, I have gastroparesis. Um, the central nervous system, we're again, central nervous system. Dark Gray says, I took the microgen and I had an embedded bladder infection that cannot be seen on a urine coach because it's embedded. I'm working with Dr. Bender, who says IC is not the condition. He has healed people for 25 years. And there are some people, Dar, who do not have chronic infection. There are some people whose symptoms began after taking ketamine that's destroyed their bladder. It's a solvent. There are many, there are millions of patients whose symptoms began after chemotherapy. 
There are millions of patients whose symptoms began directly after a physical trauma, like falling on their tailbone. Not everybody has embedded infection. And even more importantly, it's about the type of infection. So five years ago, again, our own National Institutes of Health found that many patients who were flaring were flaring because they had fungal infection. And they have now identified 13 different fungal species in the urine of IC patients. And the more fungal species you had, the worse your pain. So we cannot make blanket statements that everybody has bacterial infection. We also have to consider now the new viral studies, that we have clear viral studies, not only from the Europe, but our own National Institutes of Health, which is finding that a small population of patients Patients with Hunter's lesions have polyoma BK virus, polyoma JC virus, or Epstein-Barr virus. So I'm sorry, you're wrong. You are wrong. But can some people have chronic bacteria? Absolutely. I completely support microgen. I completely support everybody having a microgen test. Carrie says, study of ICRs and goal form goal syndrome soldiers with chronic pain show anomalies in proportional relationship with white brain matter. Exactly. Exactly. And what happens is that the white the 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 uh, the white brain matter and the gray brain matter actually gets smaller when you're under long-term stress. And then uh, other areas of the brain get bigger. I think I have that right. I might have reversed that. But anyway, that's what happens. Angela says, my endocrinologist said, the reason I don't lose weight and I can't get my thyroid under control is because I'm in a constant state of fight or flight. Yes. So you have to do your mind body medicine here. This is where uh, guided relaxation is incredibly helpful. We're trying to get the brain out of chronic fight or flight. You know, it's so funny. I'm reading on um, I'm reading this. I love reading books about I, 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 fantasy books. I do. I like vampire books and shifter books and all those books. I mean, I have to do something completely different after working with patients every day. And I'm reading this amazing book right now. And they actually talked about uh, an overload of fight or flight and adrenaline in this book. It's incredible. Sarah says, I had a baby when mine started. So let's look at that birth experience. Was, did you suffer trauma, pelvic floor trauma? Were you torn when you had your baby? Lauren says, now they want to check me for fibro and lupus, which my mom has lupus, but I've never been tested. Okay, well, you know, information is power. Lisa says it's called DTD, developmental trauma disorder. Well, you know what, Lisa, thank you. I've actually never heard that before. I want to write that down. I want to research that. Hold on a sec. Developmental. I haven't heard it said like that. D T D. Okay, I gotta look that up. Darth says, I'm now getting treatment. Uh, they look for mold, toxins, bacteria, also Lyme, parasites, EBS. You have a functional medical doctor who could, who who I see that ran every test. Good. I'm glad you got to your root cause. Just understand your root cause is different from other people's. Lisa says, I was just going to say how many people with IC have a high ACE value. Mm -hmm. uh, Lauren said, same here. I started with hyperthyroid. Now I'm hypothyroid and I'm constantly up or down with either. And that may get back to uh, that's what I'm going to be doing this year. I'm going to be working with a couple of people this year on this whole uh, porphyria connection, potentially, for some, but not all patients. Jamie said, I had my appendix, uh, gallbladder, and right kidney removed, then found out it was IC and didn't need anything removed. Oh, honey, I'm so sorry. But girl, you're not alone. This happened to a lot. I had one of my own, one of my group members uh, had a terrible, terrible flare. She goes, she went to our local community hospital and she's bawling her eyes out because she was a really, really, really severe pain patient at the time. Um, and um, what did they do? They removed her appendix and she ended up in the uh, ICU for 
10 days. I went to visit her every day. I was doing, just so you know, what was so interesting about her, um, and she's no longer with us. She actually passed away of, of something else that was going on. Um, as a, she was in a coma in the emergency, in ICU uh, with a breathing machine, obviously. Uh, she was on full life support. And I went and saw her almost every day and I held her hand and I did guided relaxation with her. I just, you know, and so what I did, I kept doing the pink bubble technique. So, and this is really good for dealing with stress and anxiety and, and, and just, well, just stress and anxiety. And so what you do is you visualize, visualize that you're holding a balloon that's floating, a small balloon that's floating with air in it, right? And you're holding onto it, right? And so now what I want you to do and what I kept telling her to do, even though she was in a coma, is um, put all of your stress, just take it out of your body, take the pain out of your body, run it down your arm and run it up the string. And you'll notice as you do that, the balloon gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Man, everything bothering you, just close your eyes. Just let it go down your arm up into the balloon. Just, and so we did that. It's like your bladder's hurting, whatever, everything, everything. Just get it up into the balloon. Now let it go. Just watch it float away, right? It's a very well-known uh, uh, technique. <laughs> she wakes up from her coma <laughs> and I got, I so saw I literally walk into the hospital and she's awake and she's like, Jill, what was up with all these balloons? <laughs> you kept talking about balloons. So a woman in a coma and she said they helped. So that's really powerful that somebody's in a coma and they can still hear and process you. And I'm not lying. She remembered that. She remembered the balloons. So there you go. Mary says, I have burning in my bladder. I've progressively gotten better. And now that is my only symptom. How do I deal with the burning? You know, burning is a weird symptom, hun. Burning is, so bladder wall pain is, is described, it's not usually described as burning. Bladder wall pain is described as sharp. Uh, razor blades, ground glass. Burning is actually more of either a dry skin symptom. Like if you've got dry skin on your vulva and you're peeing over it, then the irritants in your urine are getting on that tender skin and that can cause a burning hot sensation. So we would look for estrogen atrophy maybe that your quality and health of your skin might be causing some of that burning. But a lot of times burning actually comes from muscles. That a muscle that's working hard is a muscle that builds up lactic acid and that burns. Remember when you were a kid at school and they made you run around the track? And eventually your legs started burning. Why? Because you're working them. They're working hard. And a, working, a muscle that's working hard produces lactic acid. So that same thing happens in your pelvis, pelvic floor muscles. Is They start working hard and they burn. So if you've got a vaginal burning sensation or just a steady burning sensation, we also want to look at your muscles, hon. Kyrie is saying she's been fighting COVID since Thanksgiving. I'm so sorry. So guys, we released our COVID IC study of uh, about 100 patients, IC patients who have had COVID. 75% of them reported that their symptoms, their IC symptoms got worse. 25% basically said their symptoms did not get worse, but 75% did. That they um, had more intense flares and quite a few patients who were in remission reported their symptoms came back. Um, and, um, the reason why I published that is Kyrie for you so that you would know that you're not alone. Um, and if anything, that should give us all motivation to mask up. You need to mask up because, you know, we know active virus gets in urine that's been found in 14 studies. We know that active virus can infect uh, the kidneys and cause a viral infection of the kidneys. And 
So the question is, is do we have a, an active viral infection potentially in our bladder wall? We know that that happens with polyoma infections, that polyoma infections cause profuse bleeding of the bladder wall. And so the question is, I think the relevant question here is, is, is there a chance that the COVID virus is actually getting into some patient's bladder walls? And, and I think about it, if you've got an open Hunter's lesions or you've got estrogen atrophy, then yeah, you don't necessarily have the protection that would keep the virus out of the wall. So please mask up my friends, mask up. Uh, Carrie says, see, I, I reliance on YouTube for down regulating the uh, nervous system. Okay, I'm gonna look that up, hon. Y'all give me so much homework. Luckily, I'm a geek and I like homework. I love homework. EMDR, right? Hi, Artie. Kyrie says the sound that makes her happy is her newly adopted kitten purring. Awesome. Brenda says, my urologist called and asked me to have, uh, asked to have my eye doctor send a letter that my eyes are okay. They won't fill Elmeron again until they get the letter. Wow. Wow. Brenda, isn't that interesting? I had my check and they are fine and we'll have a CT of the eyes in March. Just remember, it's a very specific retinal exam. It's not just a, t you know, you don't just go to the plain ophthalmologist and have the, how to do retinal, a very specific retinal exam or two to verify that you don't have the Elmeron damage. Lorenza says, can I have low estrogen at 38? I had a bladder prolapse surgery and my uterine lining thinned. Uh, my pain is on the inside of my left pubic area and hurts when I sit and do intercourse. Well, hon, if you have pain that, that hurts when you sit, we're really looking at muscles and nerves. The, the fact that you had a bladder prolapse surgery tells me that your muscles have been compromised. And... Um, uh, I would, I would bet you money that you've got some trigger points on that left side, uh, muscle trigger points. You know, there's a book you need to get, Lorenza. Breaking Through Chronic Pelvic Pain by Dr. Jerome Weiss. This is the book of book of books for anybody with muscle issues, hip issues, orthopedic issues, pelvic pain. If you're a bike riders, ballerinas, dancers, et cetera, et cetera, this is the book to get. And so it would be very interesting, Lorenza, for you to look at the anatomy here and you need to have a discussion with your physical therapist and or your doctor about what structures are at the left side of your pubic area that are hurting when you're sitting. Generally, what I would guess, because I have that same issue and it's on my left side and if I sit for a long period of time, my muscles start fluttering. It's called a fasciculation and then it will start to hurt. Um, and that is a uh, partial pud uh, pudendal nerve compression, uh, IC subtype four from tight muscles. Let me check YouTube here. YouTube, are you guys okay down there? Sorry, hon, I can only look at one of you at a time. Okay, let's see, Laura says, hello, Jill from Chile, United Kingdom. I have MS and also have IC. I've hugely improved my pain levels through diet. And I'm relieved, I'm hugely appreciating your videos. Yay, glad to help. Glad, glad, glad to help. Um, <laughs> you can never do an, too many hugelies. Denise says, can I use S-Trace gel while fighting a yeast infection? Yeah, hon, you got to talk to your pharmacist about that. I can't give you medical advice like that. Um, I, I, I don't have a good answer for you. Uh, uh, Jan says, I also stop burning in the urethra and frequency. What's the best treatment for burning as, as if you got to pass urine due to the burning pain? Jan, again, generally, if you have burning in the urethra and if you're of a certain age, we're looking at estrogen atrophy, estrogen atrophy. And so you need to have somebody look at the quality and health of your skin. 
if your vulva is dry and your vagina is dry, then so is your urethra. And that's why you would have burning while you're urinating. And so just using a little topical estrogen, generally they had, they have like a pea sized drop that you just rub right into the entrance of your urethra. At least that's what I did because that's what happened when I was 51 years old. I'm older than that now. Donna says, can you speak to the relationship between COVID and IC research to support that COVID can make IC worse? So again, guys, so um, uh, we're the first group to try to study COVID and IC. I have been doing a patient survey now for about five months, six months. We got about 100 patients who so far who have participated in it. And um, I've just published the data in here as well as on our website. I did a blog on our website uh, on Friday about this. And let's just, uh, I will just give that to you. So here's the article, how COVID affects IC patients. And what we found in our survey is 74% patients reported that their IC symptoms worsened, while 23% reported that their symptoms stayed the same. 10% of those patients were hospitalized. Bladder pain increased severely in 34% of patients with 42 reporting uh, moderate or slight increase. Um, and we saw a similar breakdown for patients with uh, frequency. The 26% reported severe frequency, 40, 40 some percent reported a moderate or slight increase in frequency. Some patients reported that they were brought out of remission and are now struggling with ICD symptoms again. Several others shared that their normal treatments and flare tips such as rescue installations were not working as they had as well as they had before COVID. Um, uh, the other interesting thing was uh, quite a few patients complained of abdominal pressure, bloating, and burning during urination. Uh, and anyway, we just have a ton of patient reports here. I share a lot of the patient data on, uh, uh, so the question is, is how long do the IC symptoms last? And it appears to last um, several months, three to four months before things start to calm down. Uh, patients also had a lot of advice for patients that we shared. Um, so mask up if you wanna protect your bladder. Seriously, mask up. Kyrie, holy hell, girl. Kyrie just had massive endometriosis and she ended up in the hospital for 10 days. Wow. Girl, I am so, so sorry. You know, that I would encourage you to join the Endometriosis Association. They're an absolutely fabulous nonprofit that has, has really done so much work to help us understand why endometriosis happens. What we do know is that there are, are some very strong chemicals, man-made chemicals that are now associated with the growth of endometrial tissue, oxygen. Um, and so one of the things that they tell patients to do who have endo is you got to get rid of all the chemicals in your home. Like seriously, Obviously, plant-based uh, cleansers, you, no oven cleaners, no Febreze, no scented candles from China. It's very important that we understand that there are chemicals out there that are estrogen mimickers that can promote the growth of endometriosis also. Um, so it's like every year, there's a couple of new chemicals that have been added to that list. Kayla says, all my doctors are washing their hands of me. I, I only have frequency urgency. All urine tests are clear. They just tell me to use Azo, which does nothing. It came on about 10 days ago, but one doctor mentioned IC and it seems to have stuck. I do have endometriosis confirmed by laparotomy. Uh, no other testing done, just five UAs. So Kayla, you are technically excluded from a diagnosis of IC with just 10 days. You have to have IC, you have to have unexplained bladder symptoms for 
uh, it, and it varies in country, in some countries, six weeks, in other countries, three months or even six months. Um, given the fact that you have a history of urinary tract infections, I think it would be really interesting for you to do a next generation urine test. Uh, if you go to a website, bladderhealth.org, I would have a next generation urine test. And let's, uh, let's just find out once and for all if you do have infection, because if you do, that'll find it. But the advantage of the next gen test is it won't just find bacteria, it'll find good bacteria and bad bacteria, but it will also find uh, fungus. And that's the question is, is there a chance that you have a fungal infection? Rebecca says, I feel pain inside my urethra at the base. Does that mean my IC is nerve related? No, it probably means you have estrogen atrophy. You have had two cystos that both show a healthy bladder and urethra. I'm just wondering. So Rebecca, again, it depends on how old you are. Because the urethra is kind of the canary in the coal mine when it comes to estrogen atrophy. It's the first part of the urinary tract to start screaming when your estrogen levels drop. So I would want to know what the health of your skin is. Um, but I would also want to know what the health of your pelvic floor is. Uh, but as urethral pain can be caused by chemical irritation too. It can come from a menstrual pad. Well known, well known. If I put on a pair of underwear wash and tied within five or 10 minutes, I'll have urethral pain. So there could be some chemical irritation going on there too. Lisi is saying, please explain the difference between Urabel and Eurogesic. Well, let's just. I, I have to look at the uh, ingredients. All right. All right. So Urabel is. Methenamine, methylene blue, phenyl salicate, hyosamine, which is basically a muscle relaxing combined with the uh, salicylate to help calm pain with the methylene blue, perhaps to do a little bit of an, uh, the methamine to numb your bladder. Okay, so variations of Urabel have been around forever. Um, so it's just come under a bunch of different names. Eurogesic blue. also known as Euroblue. Same thing, hon, exactly the same thing. How do I get a subscription and join? Mary, just go over to our website, icnetwork.org, icnetwork.org. And um, you can go to the membership area or just click on our shop. And when you go to the shop, you'll see, you can, you can do it that way. Kayla, if you'd like to talk next week, I'd be happy to talk with you a little bit more. Dina says, does anybody get cold sores when they get icy flares? No. Where? Now, I, I will say we did ask patients years ago in a study, do your IC get worse if you have a herpes outbreak? And people said yes. Uh, uh, Mary, just go. There you go. Thank you. Okay, guys, uh, Tabitha says, I just got diagnosed with a UTI by Klebsiella. Is that transmitted like E. coli? You know, I don't know. I haven't really researched Klebsiella a lot, hon. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure of how, how often that's, I mean, how that is, uh, can, um, what the contagion factors are of that. Hello, John from Wisconsin. You can see I'm 16, I'm 16 minutes. I'm making progress catching up on Facebook. Anna says, hi, my dear friend, my urologist told me that I have a block in my urethra that doesn't let me empty my bladder completely. What can I do naturally to remove the block? Well, you got to understand what the block is. If it's a piece of tissue that's blocking it or like a prostate, which, you, you know, then, uh, you know, it, it's going to be removing that tissue. But if your urethra is squeezed, then it might be a muscle relaxant to try to get it to unsqueeze. Uh, you have to work with your doctor on that. Melinda says, I have my blood tests two times a year. My last two showed an increase by 
An increase of my mean corpuscular volume the last time was significantly higher. However, my primary care provider says it's nothing to worry about. Should I bring this to my urologist's attention? Sure. I, I don't know anything about that, hon. Mary says, are these talks available to watch after? Yes, they're all recorded live. I mean, they're recorded on YouTube and Facebook. Ellen says, what do I think about taking doxycycline every day to prevent a UTI? I think, that's his, I think that that is really challenging. Uh, using uh, long-term antibiotics really causes a lot of damage to the biome. And I would uh, Google that and, and see if you can get a little bit more data about that that you can talk to your doctor about. It wouldn't be something that I would do. Ursula says, great book. You got it. Yeah, Ursula, guys, seriously, this is a fantastic book. Fantastic. All right, you know what? It's time for a bio break, also known as who needs to pee? <laughs> Let's go pee, and then I'm going to start up my uh, Zoom meeting, and we'll go. We'll transition over to the Zoom meeting, too. But y'all can stay here on Facebook and YouTube. Give me a break. I need to go empty my bladder, and then uh, we will do the Zoom meeting. One moment. Oh, my muscles are sore. All right, my friends. <laughs> All right. All right. Set up this Zoom meeting. So give me one quick momento for anybody who wants to come into the Zoom meeting. And let me just, you can tell the lighting has changed now. So I got to constantly adjust the lights. If you just go over to icnetwork.org. Click on support right underneath the logo. And the second link is streamed support group meetings. And if you go to that page, there's my face. You'll see a link to the Zoom channel. And that is exactly where I'm going right now. That's how I get into the page. I am launching the meeting. Yes. Oh. You are using the computer audio. All right. All right, so hold on a sec. Let me give you guys your invitations here. All righty then. Sorry, I get it, I get it. All right, YouTube, hello Nancy. Thanks for joining us. 
All right, YouTube, you have your invite. Facebook, now Facebook, I've got to scroll down, which means I'm going to lose some of your questions. I apologize. Uh, Brenda says, I ordered the bladder builder, so can you take it with Elmeron? Um, uh, you can, tr I, I, you know, generally they they say to do one-to-one -one swaps. That's what Dr. Parsons said and Dr. The said at the 2006 IC conference, San Diego IC conference, that if you're trying to transition, they do do a one-to-one -one swap. So what he said is, if you normally took four Elmeron a day, he said, try three Elmeron and one Cisto Protec or one bladder builder. Do that for a week. See how you do. Then you can go to two-two. And then you can go to Mary wants to know about estrogen, hun. The estrogen is about how dry your skin is and only your doctor can tell you how much you should be using. Susan said she had the same issue with Tide. Yeah, isn't it weird? I don't know what it is about Tide magazine, but it is like the vulva burn burner from hell. Rebecca says, um, I'm 31 and my Eurogyne has recommended physical therapy. Estrogen atrophy sounds interesting. How do I ask my doctor to check if this is true? Um, just have them look at your skin. <laughs> I mean, it's that easy. It takes five seconds. Hi, Gay. Okay, guys, seriously, I'm going to, now I'm going to just lose a bunch of questions here on YouTube, like 20 questions. I'm so sorry, but I got to. I mean, on Facebook, I have to put the link in there and I can't scroll back. But now I wait, hold on, I can. Mary says, I have, over, have overlapping conditions, all the things you listed. Me too, hon. Uh, hold on. Okay. All right. So for anybody who wants to come into YouTube, I mean, into Zoom, you've got the invites. Please come on in. I'll let you in one at a time. And this is where you can tell your story. And if nobody wants to do it, that's fine. We'll just stay here. If y'all do want to do it, we'll do it. And then we'll come back. Kyra says, I know sticking to the same foods for almost 20 years now, no chocolate, acid, seeds, spicy, caffeine, Urabel. Is there any discount programs? Because all I have is my disability check. Honey, um, uh, there are... <laughs> I wish that we had big discount programs for everything. I will tell you with the supplement companies, I, I that's something I'm constantly doing. Cystomend, I do have a couple free bottles of Cystomend that I would be, maybe let's do these for our freebie for this meeting, is Cystomend. Um, and so hang tight, I'll give you a question and whoever um, answers the question will get it. But Kyrie, if you email me icnetwork at mac.com, icnetwork at mac.com, I will send you a bottle of system in that you can try. Okay. Okay, guys, give me one quick sec. I'll be right back. Zoom, what's happening here? Did anybody come in? I don't know. Let's open up that window. Yes, we have Lisi and Susan and Howie. All right. For anybody who wants to come in to Zoom, now please know that on Zoom people will hear you, but they will not be able to see you. Uh, so even though it's going to be open on Facebook and YouTube and they will hear what you're saying, they will not see you. Okay. Now, um, I just want to, I, I kind of, and there's Lisa. Hello, Lisa. Um, I, I do want to say, I know that sometimes I spend a little bit longer with a couple people and that makes some people leave. Um, and I, and I apologize for that. I'm just trying to help as much as I can. And so I'm going to go with, um, names I don't recognize first. 
Um, but I, I'm going to do my best. Okay. Look at your faces. You guys always make me feel so good. Donna, you have the best smile ever, ever, ever. Okay. Lisi. Let's go to Lisi first. Uh, Lisi, can you, uh, there you go. Hey girl, how you doing today? Hi. It's Lacey actually. Lacey. Okay. <laughs> well, how are you? What is going on? I'm actually doing really well today. Okay. Um, I have found out um, as I'm kind of going through my symptoms, I've actually had this since I was very, so uh, I've, I've had the overlapping overlapping symptoms. Okay. And, but I've had urinary problems, chronic UTIs, pain ever since I was um, very young. Okay. Uh, I had dysmenorrhea when I was, um, since I started menstruation, I had the pain in the, in the middle of my periods where mm -hmm. my boss used to call that middle schmerz. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> um, I had um, what they called vaginismus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, one doctor diagnosed it as vaginismus. That's not really, now that I'm learning about it um, and actually finally kind of dealing with it, I'm now 54. I was diagnosed at uh, 21. Um, so where are you today? How are you today? I mean, where are your symptoms 30 years later? Are you controlled? Are you struggling? Well, I um, have actually only been diagnosed with IC for just over a year. Okay. Um, I started having really, really bad problems. Okay. They finally got me the IC diagnosis. Okay. Um, um, I'm controlled mainly with, I think, by diet. Okay. And lowering my stress level. Okay. Um, I'm already on disability because of other um, pain problems. Okay. <laughs> um, lower back, fibromyalgia, lots of lots of other autoimmune stuff. Yeah. Um, so I see is just sort of like uh, the, kind of the end of the line for me. <laughs> well, okay, but but given your age, are you still having your periods or not? I've had a hysterectomy. When did so you I do so, not have my periods? I'm not sure if I'm in peri or if I'm actually postmenopausal. Um, I when do when did you have the hysterectomy? Uh, 2010. Okay, so, so, so 11 years ago. And they took your ovaries? Uh, no, I still okay. have my ovaries. Okay. Okay. Um, but I've always had pain with um, intercourse. And not always, actually, um, I started when I was 21. That's what the diagnosis of vaginismus came right. for. Right. Um, and that was kind of misdiagnosed and uh, also given the wrong treatment for it. So, and I've only just figured that out um, since my, I'm in pelvic floor therapy um, now. Okay. In pelvic, and doing, a, I've just gotten a lot of books um, okay, so so what did the pelvic floor physical therapist find at your first appointment? Were your muscles super tight? Yes. Okay. Yes, I'm, I'm sort of in what she calls constant kegel. <laughs> right. Okay. So so this book. Do you have this book yet? No, that one I don't have. I, okay. I wrote that down to get. Okay. So and you can get this. You can get this through our shop. Um. Um. So Dr. Weiss was a urologist treating IC back in the 70s when he very quickly saw that bladder therapies weren't working. And so he started looking outside of the bladder for other potential causes and ended up basically specializing in muscles and nerves. He became a myofascial specialist. Mm -hmm. And the guy had the hands of gold. He was an expert. When it came to muscle tension and trigger points, if you walked in with a trigger point, the odds are you would walk out of the, uh, that appointment without a trigger point. Uh, he was very good at calming muscles and calming nerves and relaxing the muscles and getting them to lay flat like they're supposed to. What baffled him is why did the tension come back in exactly that same spot? Why did the trigger point come in exactly that same point? And that's when he took a step back and started looking at bones. 
That means that there is a structure, there is a structure putting pressure on this muscle group somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and so often it's the SI joint. S so we got right. the SI joint that's an issue. Obviously it can be a hip, it can be a knee. If you're, if you're not walking normally, then it could be a knee. But what he found in his book is that 90% of the patients who kept having muscle tension come back over and over and over, it was about how they were walking. It was their feet. So if you have a history of shin splints, plantar fasciitis, if you have Morton's toe, Morton's neuroma, if you have one leg longer than the other, if you have an ankle that turns inward or an ankle that turns outward, um, that explains, that could explain why you've had chronic muscle tension your entire life. You know, if you, again, if you have one leg longer than the other, um, let me just grab my copy here real quick. I don't want to bend up that copy because that's, that's going to be a, a freebie for somebody at some point in time, but I want to just The only challenge with this book is that um, they did not do an index. It took him 15 years to write the book. And um, he's now retired and in his 80s, and he's not doing particularly well. Um, so this is one concept that he wants people to understand is that the pelvic floor muscles and the pelvis, the pelvis is the center of the human body, but it's going to absorb forces coming up from your feet as you're walking. So there is an upward sensation of stresses and pressures that reach the pelvis. But, all right, there's, I wanna find this one picture, hold on, I think this. And who was it who was having pain on the lower left-hand side? He's got a map of all the trigger point locations. Ooh, that's nice. Oh, that's really good. That's helpful. Right. Yeah. I colored it in. I, that's how I process information as I, I color important points. This is where I'm getting my, my dominant issue right now is, uh, is my, uh, my thighs. Boy, do I have a ton of trigger points in my thighs right now. Um, I do as well. Where is this picture? Oh, here, okay, here we go. Here we go, here it is. Okay, so, so here we have a, a normal leg. And if we go all the way up, you can definitely see the structures and you can see the muscles connecting to the, the hip bone, et cetera, et cetera. Now here is an ankle that's rolling inward. And you can see that it Im immediately is forcing the bones farther out to the side and stretching this side of the pelvic floor, then causing chronic tension. And so again, what he found in his clinic, he talked it, he called it as uh, un unwrapping the, the layers of an onion or peeling back the layers of an onion. And that's really what he found in, um, in his chronic pain patients. And the last layer for many of them was actually how they were walking. And so you've got, that's what I would do. If, if I were you working with your pelvic floor physical therapist, especially if the tension is, is not resolving quickly or it's coming back consistently over and over, have a discussion with her about your bones and ask her if she thinks that there's anything else contributing to pressure at that side. Is it your SI joint, your hip, your knee? She should be, she should have walked, she or he should have uh, watched you walk down a hallway to see if you're walking normally. Okay. I, I really, I'll bring, yeah. I'll bring that up. She knows that I have, I've had several back surgeries and I do have SI problems and yeah. hip problems. And yeah. Um, so she does, work on my hips. She's actually worked more on my um, ab abdominals and my hips more than um, the pelvic floor. Okay. <laughs> she wants to get all that stuff worked 
uh, before she starts working on the pelvic floor. Well, they all connect. I mean, and, so, and, and you yeah, start right. from the outside and work your way in. So, hon, it's going to be a very interesting journey for you. But I think it's very, very promising. And just keep it up. Yeah, thank keep you it so up. much. All right, hon. Nice talking with you, Lacey. Now, I'm going to go next to Rebecca. Hi, how are you? Hey, girl, I'm pretty good today. How are you? Oh, I'm, I'm okay. So I'm the one that was asking you, uh, I was messaging you. I'm the 31 year old. I live, um, in Brooklyn, New York, and I'm a hairstylist. So I'm exposed to chemicals all yeah. day long. Yeah. Um, which is something that my, um, urogynecologist and I have talked about. So I've only had IC for, it's coming up on two years in February. I okay. never had any kind of UTIs. I don't have a history of any of that. And then all of a sudden I went to Mexico and I came back and had a UTI. And my thought was that I got some kind of bacterial infection from the water there after doing some research, Okay, but I don't know. So I've had two cystoscopies. Everything looks normal. Um, I'm on amitriptyline and it has helped a lot, especially with like sleeping at night, but I'm still experiencing a lot at the base of my urethra, like inside. And um, it feels I'm on my feet all day long. And you mentioned when you were talking to Lacey about the one leg longer than the other. So I have one leg that's longer than the other. So I was wondering, maybe that could be a contributing thing. I, I really like my urogynecologist. I just feel like there's something that we're missing. You well, know? okay. So have you had a pelvic floor exam? So she did. Um, she did actually tell me that my pelvic floor is extremely tight, and yeah. she has okay. recommended <laughs> me to see a pelvic floor therapist. Okay. I'm, she recommended this woman who is like the top person in Brooklyn, and I'm on the wait list, and Good. I've been on the wait list for about three weeks now. So you've got uh, at least you've got excellent, excellent pelvic floor physical therapists in New York, in in New York City. Amy Stein at Beyond okay. Basics Physical Therapy, and she is the author of, where is her book? Where do I have it? Here it is. She is the author of okay. this book, Heal Pelvic Pain. Heal Pelvic Pain. I mean, it's okay, important to know that. because, you know, if you walk in, oh, look, yeah, Donna's holding up hers. Okay. Okay. And this is for men and women. Um, okay. And then um, Issa Herrera, this is her pregnancy book, but she has a book, a book for men and women, ending male pelvic pain and ending female pelvic pain. Issa Herrera, let's see, I-S-A, I don't know if you can see that. Yes. Uh, she's at Renew Physical Therapy, Renew Physical Therapy. So you've got some of the best in the world right there. So you're, you're going to be in good hands. So, and you actually, I'm sorry, continue. Okay. So, um, I, 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 I want to say something that might be slightly offensive to your profession and I don't mean for it to be. Okay. So bear with me here for a moment. Um, out here in California, um, our hair salons, especially for younger folks are Style 101. Man, those girls are wearing high heels all day. They are doing every, I mean, and um, Dr. Weiss talks about the concept of wear and tear on the, mus on, on the muscular, muscular system. And okay. the fact that when you're a teenager, you can get away with it. And when you're in your 20s, you can get away with wearing high heels and stuff. You don't start seeing the pelvic floor wear and tear injuries until your 30s. And even though you're young, your pelvic floor has already been tweaked because you have one leg longer than the other. And so okay. I, I, you, so you've really got to improve how you're standing. You should not be wearing any heels at all. And that, okay. might, that might be hard, but you're, you're, it is. yeah, I mean, and, I mean, that's the thing is thankfully we now have 
you know, comfort style and yoga style. And so if you're, so just embrace a yoga mentality and okay. I would recommend, hold on, let me get them. Now, again, if this is hard, but you gotta, you gotta embrace your inner athlete. Okay. Hoka. Hoka. And their website is Hoka One One or Hoka One One O N E O N E dot com. Okay. These are their bondies. Okay. These are like walking on clouds. Okay. And on, um, you know, we're we're similar in that. In, in I was a in college. And I was a professional athlete for a while and I destroyed my feet. My workout was a hundred flights of stairs a day. I would swim a mile or two and then I would row five miles. And I did that every day for 10 years, which is kind of the equivalent of you standing every day for 10 years. Right. And in the end, we end up breaking down uh, supportive tissue in our feet. And I have no fat pads on my feet at all. I, okay. I, I can I have to wear uh, shoes that have a lot of plush padding. I used to love my Birkenstocks. I can't wear Birkenstocks now. They're not enough padding. Hoka's, they're listen. This is going to be like 150 bucks. Okay. They have a great return policy. There's a really cute lavender shade right now. Are to die for good. Okay. And I can do everything. I wear these all day, every day, pretty much now. And I have a whole bunch of different pair. I just buy like one pair every six months when I can afford it. All sorts of different. And I know, and, I, and I'm sorry, because I know that you, you're, have, you're having trouble imagining that working in a salon. Just try it once or at least rotate one day a week. Try to wear those two days a week so that you're not stressing your, your feet and your legs and your pelvic floor. Okay. okay. I had one more question. Yes. You, um, you had mentioned in, in my question that I asked you on the Facebook group, you had mentioned estrogen atrophy, and that's something that I've never really heard of before. Um, it's never been brought to my attention. So I just was wondering if you could just speak a little bit more on that. Well, so, so, um, um, uh, as we know during puberty that hormones turn on, all the joys of puberty that, you know, we, that's when we get all emo and we get emotional and we start having periods and all that sort of stuff. And that's all about basically facilitating having children. Estrogen critic is critically important to the health of our reproductive tract and the health, the health of our tissues down below. Um, unfortunately, um, your bladder and your vulva and your urethra and your mouth rely on a thick coating of mucus to protect itself. You know, because again, urine is body waste. Urine contains ammonia and urea and all sorts of icky things. So how can the bladder hold ammonia for hours at a time and not get damaged? And the answer is it has a really nice thick coating of mucus. Okay. And unfortunately, that mucus is estrogen dependent. So when you're young, you have a lot of mucus. You can get away with a lot of crap. When you're older, you have much less mucus and thus your skin's ability to defend itself is now compromised. But honey, at your age, unless you've had a hysterectomy, I really, I doubt that that has anything to do with it. I bet good money this is all due to your muscles. Everything is probably due to your muscles. I think you're, I see subtype three pelvic floor driven and, okay. and it's being driven by the fact that you've got one leg slightly longer than the other. You might want to talk to a podiatrist and see if they can give you a little lift to get your, get your hips level so that they're, your hips are not working in opposition to each other and that they're supporting each other equally, maybe. Um, okay. And it's a, it's a do or die moment. You know, it's just you're at that point now where you just are not going to be able to wear high heels for a long period of time without causing more damage to muscles and ligaments and fascia. You're, ha okay. you're having that, you know, hallelujah moment with careers. You're kind of like the, 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 uh, 
taxi driver sitting for a long period of time, eventually this pelvic floor is going to get tight or the judge right. who's sitting for a long period of time. So, but right. I'm, you know, but listen, the pelvic floor responds beautifully to therapy. Were you a dancer, by the way, when you were young, did you do any dance or ballet? Were you no. an, were you an athlete? I wasn't, but I was a musician. Um, so I playing standing bass. So I've just been standing pretty much since I was like 10 years old for okay. long periods of time. Okay. Okay. So I think you're going to be doing some pelvic floor work and muscle health, health work for a couple of years. You're going to need to okay. do that. As long as you're standing for a long period of time, you need to know what to do at the end of the day to get those muscles out of tension. Okay. Okay. But I'm very, op I'm very optimistic for you. There's nothing about your case that's scary. There's nothing okay. about it that's alarming in any way, shape, or form. It can everything makes total sense. But now you got to buckle down and learn about those muscles and what can you do to get those muscles to relax and release. Okay, thank you. So okay, much. you are very, very welcome. I wish you well and please keep in touch. Yes, thank you. Okay, all right. Let's see here. Um, you know what? I got I can't see everybody here. Hold on a sec. Susan, Susan, I can see you there. Can, I'm going to try to unmute you. Can you unmute yourself, Susan? There you go. Thank hey, you. Hey, girl, how are you today? How is life? Uh, I'm letting this get me down. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Talk I'm to try, me. I try. I listen to you often. I'm grateful for you going on the air like you do. Uh, um, my pleasure. And I do all the census thing, but I get discouraged and I'm thinking, gosh, this, this isn't working. And they tell my husband, but, um, so I've been dealing with this for eight months and originally I thought I had a bladder infection and my pain is like bladder pressure. Okay. Um, and when it flares up that bad, I feel like I have to go pee a lot, but normally on a normal day, I don't. Okay. I've got bladder pressure and then I have rectal pain where it's nerve pain. It's like hot pain. Okay. And it's kind of pretty much like simultaneous. It goes back and forth. It bounces from my bladder to my rectum to my bladder to my rectum. Okay. And then so touching, like if I touch my tummy, it's like sensitive walking. The vibration hurts when I, cause I like to walk. Okay. Um, sitting is very difficult. I can't sit. Um, it'll start hurting. And then driving is impossible. So um, my doctor sent me to a urogyno after trying antibiotics. And then um, my urogyno did an MRI, CT scan, urodynamic test. Okay. Uh, DNA urine test, which I talked her into. Okay. Uh, everything everything came back normal. Okay. Um, I think she's getting tired of the whole thing. She's like throwing in the towel. She's pretty much releasing me. And she told me to go to a pain doctor. I feel really discouraged because my gut's telling me there's something causing this. Okay. You know, I, I'm trying to rule other things out other than IC. She told me she didn't think I had IC based on the urodynamics. Okay. But she suggested trying infusions. Well, um, what's to rule it out? So okay. I'm kind of scared of that hurting or is that like. Well, I see. Okay. So, so. Remember, everything you are an anatomical mystery to be solved. We have to understand your body, right? Before yeah. we can talk about therapies, we have to have a much clearer understanding of what structures are potentially involved in your pelvis. Yeah. Okay. So, so let's just kind of go th go through that because your case is a little bit complex. So, the first thing that popped out to me is that you have pain when you sit down, correct? Yeah. And right. when you stand up, does the pain go? Is the pain improve? I do much better when I'm standing. Okay. Okay. Um, so that's not. I do pretty well when I stand and walk around, but I get tired and then I want to sit down and then it, it's just uncomfortable when I sit. Okay. So, so that. I lay down a lot. Right. So that's not your bladder. That's your pelvic Even floor. Even when I lay down, it bothers my, my bottom, like my rectum. Right. Okay. So that's your pelvic floor. My bottom hits my leather sofa. Yeah. yeah. And so, so I guess she so, sent me to a colorectal surgeon. Well, I don't, but have you, wait, 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 wait. You just gotta, gotta bear with me here for a moment. Cause I gotta, we gotta work through things logically. 
cheers. So, okay. So, so look. I have a lot of adhesions too. I thought I'd mention too, because I've had three surgeries. So. What kind of surgeries have you had? Um, I'm 67 and I had these like 30 years ago. I had three different ones. My left ovary was removed with a traditional scar. Okay. That one I think gives me trouble. And then uh, uterus removed through my vagina. When they took that out, they told me there was um, a lot of adhesions and they accidentally nipped my uh, bowel and they had to call a specialist in. So I know there's adhesions in there. Um, that was like 20 years ago. Okay. And so I had, you know, several surgeries. And then when I had colonoscopies in the past, they told me I had a, um, a colon uh, that was adhesion bound colon. So I know I have adhesions. So I'm just wondering, you know, is it the adhesions? Well, is it pelvic floor? Well, okay. So, so let's just, let's just. Put it on. So this mm. is, so here's your pelvis. Yeah. Okay. So when you're sitting, you're sitting directly on these muscles, yes. your levator anis, right? Yes. And of course, we have nerves that go through here. Yes. So, so that sitting pain is not bladder pain at all. That it? it's odd how I feel it in my bladder, huh? No, well, but but your bladder is affected by it. You know, I mean, your bladder. Okay. I mean, let's just put these structures back in here for a moment. And I don't have any ovaries or uterus. So. Okay, so we'll leave that out, but let's put the, uh, let's put the bowel in here, chew. Okay, so this is your, this is your pelvis right now. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so we have a bladder and we have a pelvis and we have pelvic floor muscles. And, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. so, um, again, when we're sitting, you're, you're sitting on the levators, including your, I mean, the levators that are up here, but you're also sitting on the levators back here where your rectal pain is. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, now for those of you watching and listening who know me, you know, I have no shame. I will pretty much talk about anything and at I'm all. I'm with you on that. So <laughs> um, I am a pelvic floor patient. My dominant, okay. my dominant pain is on my left side due to my SI joint. I have what I call, now I'm not saying this is a correct word, rectodynia, uh -huh. where my rectum is just sensitive. Yeah. The nerves in my rectum are on a hair freaking trigger. Oh, God, yeah. If there is anything sitting in there, even a little tiny piece yes. of stool, yes. Yes. I am insane. Yes. Which is I keep feeling like I got to go to the bathroom. Well, it's not, sometimes you feel like you have to go to the, you have to urinate or you have to have a bowel movement and there's really legitimately nothing there. It's a pelvic floor spasm. But it, what happens when you sustain a trauma and you've had multiple traumas, we get allodynia. That means that proximal nerves in the area are also more sensitive. And that mm -hmm. is the rectodynia. The, my rectum was never damaged by anything. I mean, it was mm -hmm. never damaged. But I had really significant issues with nerves on my left side and thus the nerves on the right side, the nerves in the front and the nerves in back are more involved. I mean, I had vulvodynia in high school. And for me, the, I broke my tailbone when I was like in seventh grade. And that's when things started for me. Wow. So with the rectodynia, that's like, you know, people ask me how I am. And it's like my bladder's fine. My vulva's fine right now. But the whole rectal thing is just a daily freaking annoyance. Oh my God. And so when my rectum starts hurting, I know right away that my bladder is going to react. And that usually goes back and forth. Like, well, oh it's, no, but it's, the bladder, but it's the, the it's the muscles and the nerves that are actually doing it. Um, yeah. My rectum is healthy. There's nothing wrong with it. My bladder is healthy. There's nothing wrong with it. It's the yeah, nerves in the area are I'm sensitive. Mm -hmm. So, you know, okay, again, I have absolutely no shame and I'll, I, I have true confessions. And so like I have gloves in my bathroom and I have KY in my bathroom. Yeah. And before I go to bed, if I feel, if I feel anything in there, I cannot sleep. Mm -hmm. I have to use my gloves and my KY and flip it out. Really? Oh God. Yeah. I've had oh. to, I, 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 yeah, you know, other people are nodding their heads. I, I won't say it. who, I uh -huh. 
And, and, and again, that's just a sign of a nerve that's irritated. And so, you know, I, I, I've been to an IBS specialist and, and what I can say for me, and I was going to do an article on this because it got a lot worse after Christmas for some reason, Mm -hmm. but what was happening with Christmas for me is that I wasn't eating well at all. And I wasn't eating fiber at all. And I basically started passing rocks. Oh gosh. You know what I mean? You guys, That's you know good. what I mean? Marbles. I know. And they call, and then they're small, they're small at first. So you don't necessarily yeah. feel them until you got five or six or seven marbles down there. Oh, and then gosh. you're like, Oh, oh holy gosh. hell. I eat vegetables every day because of, I don't want that to happen. Well, you got to eat 20 grams of fiber a day at a minimum to be, yeah. to have normal bowel movements. So I've like just massively right. up my fiber again. Cause I, I mean, some of that stuff on your website for the fiber for the, yeah, the acacia dolphin. fiber. Yeah. The, the, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm doing that every day too now. Cause I, I need to get myself out of this hard marble irritating nerve yeah. thing. As Is I, your pain like hot, like hot pain? Mm-hmm. Mine feels like a nerve hot pain right up the anus, right in there, hot. It can be when it's really bad. Um, it feels like I want to put an ice cube in there. Well, and so um, have they looked for any internal hemorrhoids? Um, I went to a colon- colorectal specialist. He checked in there and he says, I don't see anything. He didn't, wasn't able to go up too high because I didn't do a cleanse. I didn't realize I didn't know I was supposed to. Yeah, but it's and, really low. I mean, it's literally the first yeah. four inches. It's like finger, right. he finger looked length. Up there and he said, I don't see anything. Um, but what you're describing definitely is nerve pain. So, so sometimes they give you a a steroid Mm -hmm. suppository. That would be nice. Yeah. Um, And I would, I would send him a message and and just tell him that the rectal pain is pretty persistent and, and you're unclear if it's muscle or, or the nerves in your rectum, although he said it was nerves. Ask him if, if you're doing a, a steroid suppository is reasonable. I, I have had to do that several times in the last 20 years, maybe three or four times where the nerves just got so irritated and it was my own fault because I got constipated and I wasn't yeah. eating right. And, you yeah. know, it just worked everything up. Right. Um, so I ended up going to a pelvic floor rehab also. Okay. And what did they find with your muscles? You know, I, she said it's a combination of things. Okay. What'd she say? You know, I've been under a lot of stress. I have, um, she said the muscles are a little bit tight. I can't remember all of the different categories, but she just said that it's a combination of things. And okay. then my age, because I, you know, I have to put that insert that, um, a pessary cream. In my, no, I have to insert the cream in my vagina for, okay. because I, because I'm postmenopausal. Okay. So she's saying, you know, she's just saying it could be all of these different things. And so she's doing treatment on me and I've gone probably six times and she does internal yeah, treatment. That's the way you do it. And yeah. It's uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, but I've done six of them and I haven't really improved. So I'm kind of getting nervous and scared that this isn't going to be the answer and that maybe it's something else. Okay. I don't know if I would notice you know, this quickly. Okay. So, so seriously, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a duck. You have, you have muscle problems. You've had multiple, you've had multiple surgeries, son. You have adhesions. You've got stuff going on down there. That's another thing. It's adhesions. It's, you know, everything. Okay. So So if it's adhesions, I don't know. I don't know. Will she be able to help with adhesions? Because they've been in there for 25, 30 well, years. But, but here's the reality. You know, if you're, your, your muscles are, you've gone through several pelvic surgeries. Yeah. You have scar tissue. Uh, absolutely. Okay. And, and whenever you're in pain, your muscles are going to get tight to protect you from that pain. Whenever oh you're God. under stress, yeah. Your muscles are going to get tight in a fight or flight response. So you Mm -hmm. have muscle issues. Yeah. And you're going to be working on muscle issues for, for, for probably the rest of your life, like me, because when your muscles get tight, things get messed up. And so, no, this, no, now come on. Now, now, now listen, girl. Now, now listen here. Because I never had a problem, and all of a sudden, this no, like you ha- that's not true. You had a problem 20 years ago, you've had multiple surgeries, yeah. You, you, ha- you have you have had issues, pain. okay. 
but but the reality here is that you know nobody can tell you when to pee you're the only person who knows when you need to pee right mm -hmm. and really mm -hmm. nobody can tell you the health of your pelvic floor muscles better than you can tell the health of your pelvic floor muscles and yeah. th this is where i think this is about you learning your body okay you've got to learn your body Right. And, and right now you're afraid to touch everything because everything hurts. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and you don't be afraid of the pain because if she, can, if she's touching something and triggering pain, I call that the hallelujah moment. That's okay. like, all right, what are you touching? Tell me what you're touching yeah. here. We have to, we have to figure out these structures and so I think that what I would want you to do is I would want you to be a lot more engaged during physical therapy. I want you to, to be able to walk in there knowing and being able to visualize what she's touching. Okay. You know? Um, and so again, if we look at this, if we look at the, the equivalent of your pelvis, but let's just take your bladder out here for a moment. And she has her finger in here. Uh -huh. I, I want you to be able to visualize where she's touching okay. and, and what's painful. And that's where you, your dialogue is with her is, okay, what do you think is causing that? Is that an adhesion? Is that a trigger point? Does that make sense? You know, yeah. mm -hmm. um, you know, the human body is wired for healing. Healing never turns off. You can okay. go to bed at night with the comfort in knowing that the human body and nature is absolutely amazing. Your body is trying to fix whatever's going on, mm -hmm. but you have to create an environment to support healing also. And that means we've got to get your muscles relaxed and normal. We've got to get you out of anxiety because you're, you're in the mid, you're in early wind up. I can tell by the way you're talking, you're in early wind up because you're starting to be afraid and you're, you know, about I'm, going I get back. myself crying hysterical at home. My husband can't deal with it. He goes outside. It's terrible. It's okay. Terrible. Okay. So you're, you're, in, you're not an early wind up. You're in significant wind up right now. I, yeah. I'll have a better day where I'm okay. And I'm happy because normally I'm a happy person. I'll yeah. Like me too. Singing to songs and working around the house. And then, then the next day I'm on the ground, I'm on the sofa falling for four hours. Okay. Okay. So Pain that is accompanied by anxiety is intensified by the brain. That's how the brain processes it. So if you, if you, uh, with your bladder pain, the pain message is going from your bladder to your spinal cord. It's going up your spinal cord to your lower brain. Your lower brain is the gate. It only sends the most important pain messages through. Then it gets yeah. the midbrain. The midbrain establishes context. So mm -hmm. the midbrain is looking at all your memories happen to you as well as your state of mind and if your pain is by tears your midbrain is going uh-oh her life is in jeopardy and it will intensify the pain but pain yeah. that, pain that is accompanied by laughter is minimized by the brain because your brain is going oh yeah man she loves to ride this roller coaster and it hurts every time but it's a roller coaster she's fine oh, God. and then the yeah. And then the midbrain sends it to the upper brain that, and the upper brain then gets you to, to move and do whatever you need to do. There's yeah. nothing scary about this process. You're not peeing blood right now. No, not you, at all. I don't have burning or anything. Right. What you, have, what, what you have are very clear symptoms that muscles and nerves are involved. And so you, my friend, need to, you know what? Okay, so here's my other, here's my other freebie to you. I'm going to have that. I bought it. Oh, well, girl, have you, yeah. re have you read it? I'm reading it. It's a little bit difficult understanding some of the stuff, you know, and it gets heavy into the diagrams and stuff, but okay. I just started reading it. I'm probably four chapters in. So, so you're, so you're going, you're doing the work. The first four chapters are work. The first four chapters are, it's a master class in pelvic anatomy, yeah. right? But that yeah. now as you work through the rest of the book, you're going to be able to come back and understand some of those concepts a little bit more. Okay. I think that, that 
whatever happened 20 years ago, as well mm -hmm. as before that, it is the foundation for where you are today. And wow. that is that your muscles are tight and they've probably yeah. never been addressed. And, you, and then also mm -hmm. you're older now. Your, muscle, yeah. your muscles are a little bit weaker and you're in estrogen atrophy now, which would right. potentially explain any urethral right. pain or bladder wall pain. Yeah. And so... My doctors... Go ahead. Um, what, uh, now, you tell me, what, is, what did your doctor just say? Say that again. Oh, she, she was saying, well, maybe you could try... Since she didn't know what else to tell me, she said, maybe you can go to a neurologist and she something wrong with your spine or... Go to a gyno yeah. oncologist because they do a lot of surgeries and they she can address adhesions whether or not to try to remove them. Well, I mean, the, um, I I mean, yeah, man, you have we have a big checklist of things to rule out for you. You know, number no. one, we got to know this the health of your muscles. Number two, two we've got to understand what role adhesions are playing in anything. Number three, we got to understand estrogen atrophy and if that's contributing to it. But I get so overwhelmed. Well, and, 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 you know, uh, look, it, there's no one treatment fits all approach here. You're going to yeah. be, you're fighting little fires. And that's a thing with, with, um, with nerve sensitization. We want to try to address anything that's hurting. And so yeah. my priority would be, what can we do to calm the rectal pain? Um, yeah. we, if we can get the rectal pain calmed down, then, then that will wind down the nervous system down there a little bit more. And so if you can talk to him and see if a steroid suppository would be reasonable for you, I think that anything that we can do that would calm things down there would be reasonable. Even a B&O suppository, if he, if he would be a belladonna opium suppository, let's see if we can find something that would calm some of that down. Maybe they have some other ideas on what to do. I know that at the AUA three years ago, they talked about um, a vaginal and rectal CBD suppositories. Mm -hmm. And that might be interesting. Anything we can do to just kind of take the fire out of that nerve that's shooting right so now. Whenever it's flared up, just stick one of those in there, huh? Yeah, yeah. It's and and maybe, you know, a couple of days out of the week and then maybe I'm okay for three or four days, but then those days my bladder's flared. So it's like well, it's but backwards. well, but the second thing is, I, I I think it'd be really interesting for you to do a little bit of a diary. I would be very curious about comparing sitting and your symptoms. Do you notice uh -huh. that your rectal pain gets worse if you've been oh, for sitting sure. for a long period of time? Well, I'm sitting now on a cushion, so uh, she, my doctor, also told me pretty much she's, you know releasing me and she told me to go to a pain doctor but that kind of discouraged me I thought well she's given up on me and now I'm just going to take drugs well she hasn't given up on you you have exceeded her skill set yeah she's I guess I look at she's not good she's all. not good enough or more experienced for you so We're, a pain doctor well, is that a pelvic pain specialist would be ideal where do you live on what state I live in California in the uh, Bay Area. Okay, so you could number one, you could go down and, to Vista Urology and see Chris Payne. Okay, I've heard of that. And Jeanette Potts. Chris Chris yeah. ran the IC research program at Stanford for twenty five years. Uh, somebody, uh, somebody gave me a name of somebody at the um, at Stanford that is a good pain doctor right now. The Stanford. It's a, it's a woman, and she's Asian, and sure. I watched her videos. Yeah, sure. So is that nor? I mean, is that typical to go to a pain? I feel like I'm given up on me. Well, we can't no, help you. okay, Just but okay, but stop it, stop it. She hasn't given okay. up on. She has not given up on you. You have exceeded her skill set. She's not okay. good. She's not good enough for you. She's not. Well, ex there, she's okay. not experienced enough to work through your pelvic pain, like yeah. somebody like Chris Payne who has yeah. seen thousands of patients and chaired National Institutes of Health IC meetings. And Chris Payne's practice has one of the best physical therapists in California. Mm -hmm. And so, so, you know, that is an option. And when you go there, it's going to be, you know, you are going not as an IC patient, you're going as a pelvic pain patient. 
with bladder and rectal pain and pain with sitting. Right. And you're going there to have them study your pelvis. We're looking for yeah. an analysis of the structures in your pelvis. We're not talking about treatments yet. We're, yeah. just, we're just trying to figure out what the hell is going on down there. Because your, right. your situation is pretty complex. Yeah. And then he would be somebody who w- could not only assess your muscles. I mean, he's the guy that created the subtyping system that we use. Mm-hmm. But and so we know his diagnostic skills are exceptionally good, um, yeah. but his knowledge of structures is good. And if you can just point to different areas that are causing any different symptoms, then you're not, right. you know, so. And again, there are a lot of people listening to us right now on um, when you go for a second opinion, please don't walk in and ask about therapy. You're going to walk in and say, can you please help me understand what's triggering this symptom? Yeah. And we just need them to spend an hour talking about your body and studying your body before we can go to therapy. Yeah. And so, you know, you should go to the neurologist first and rule out the spine problem. I think that I think that that's a box you should check out. I would I would think I would want an appointment with a neurologist. I would want an appointment with somebody like Chris Payne. And I would, yeah. I would maybe also consider making an appointment at Stanford because their pelvic pain center is, is quite good. Um, okay. And, and what do you think about the infusions that my doctors, I think she's frustrated with me because I said, do I, you told me I don't have ICU. Why would I need infusion? Exactly. I, but they're not infusions. So you get to rule it out. They're installations. They're called installations. installations. It, I, I'm sorry, I, I gave it the wrong name. Installation. I show. think that doing a one-time anesthetic installation or a heparin lidocaine installation would be fascinating, because if okay. they can put, um, if they can numb your bladder and if that turns all of your pain symptoms off, including yeah. your rectal pain, then we yeah. kn- we know that that's all being driven by your bladder. I I seriously doubt that it's being driven by your bladder, but for your peace of mind, for you to know once and for all, yeah, having her do a installation with ret with heparin and lidocaine or just lidocaine would be fascinating. It would be fascinating to have done. Okay. Cause I was not, I was reluctant, but she, I think she said once a week for three weeks or something. Well, like I mean, you know, you can't, uh, you need to have a discussion about what she wants to do. This is not a silver nitrate or DMSO moment. I mean, I think the first, po- the first question is just to see if numbing your bladder makes a difference. And so having a heparin lidocaine rescue installation makes total sense. It would be very interesting to see how you did with that. Do they, do they really typically use the same ingredient in those? No, there are lots of, there are lots of different formulas. You can, I have a whole area on our website oh. that you can read about that. So I don't know what she was going to do. Well, ask her, than... ask her. And yeah. if, if she says silver nitrate or chlorpactin, you're going to say, no, thank you. I'm not interested in that. But if you say, listen, I'm curious if we numb my bladder, will that make my pain go away? I'm totally willing to give that a shot. So I don't want to have silver nitrate or floor. What? Well, there. Just go on over to our website to the bladder installation area. They're old therapies okay. that are not done anymore. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, so you are still an anatomical mystery to be solved. I am. I and, but, am. but you're not scary. This is not scary. This I, is your. This is not forever. I know, but you're. And then this hit me. Okay. Eight months of this. I I know. I get it. I understand that. Um, so discouraging. Well, but but. There are far more doors open than closed. You have okay. literally, you have literally one of the best doctors in the world that you haven't been to right there. So I before- wish it was a little closer because I live in Brentwood and it's quite a long drive. It's probably an hour and a half drive and sitting. Oh my God. Yeah. It'll be a real but difficult see, time but see, to go the, in one day. But the fact that sitting is bothering you really is pointing to your muscles and your nerves. Yeah. And I have a six inch cushion. You know, those ones that breastfeeding moms use those great big round ones. Yeah. Big round ones. I sit on that in my car. I, I, if I were a betting woman, I would best, I would bet that you have a pudendal neuralgia. I would bet that you've got Mm -hmm. something that's compressing the pudendal nerve that's driving the rectal pain and driving some of the other symptoms that you're having. Yeah. 
And from so, what I was reading, I was reading somewhere, and I was saying that you could have adhesions that are that are like blocking a nerve. Yeah, you could have adhesions that are wrapping on a right that are wrapping around a nerve, or you could have a muscle that's wrapping around a nerve. But the hallmark symptom of pudendal neuralgia is pain with sitting that is relieved by standing. And so I think you're. I think we're dealing with a musculoskeletal issue for you rather than a bladder. The bladder doesn't make sitting hard. The fact that you've got to sit on a six inch cushion is pointing directly to muscles and nerves. Mm -hmm. And, and so, and you know, Jeanette Potts is a master at pelvic floor and understanding the pelvic floor. Well, Jeanette Potts is practices with Chris Payne. They're married. Oh, okay. That's his wife. Yeah. And then you also it's have, it's not covered on insurance. You, w- yeah. You also have pelvic health and rehabilitation. They have several clinics throughout. The- That's where I go. That's where I go. Okay. Well, they're, they're superb. Her name is Melinda. Okay. I mean, they're superb. They're literally uh-huh. one of the best clinics in the world. So I'm lucky I'm going, I have her. I you take are. cash there also. They don't take insurance. Oh yeah. God, yeah. Me. Yeah. But still, you know, but I don't care if they could fix me. I don't care how much it costs. I, I, yeah, I know, but, but it's a, it's going to be a slow daily gradual process of working on stuff. It's not going to be fixed overnight. We have yeah. to take time. We got to build your skills in your muscles. We got to build your skills and how to relax those muscles. We have to build your anxiety management skills because they're definitely, if you're having bouts where you're crying like mad, um, mm-hmm. that's not going to help. That's, and that's explainable. I've been there. Uh, not like yeah. I haven't been there. Um, if you're struggling, so do, you, do you still get pelvic, um, assist? Do you still go to a pelvic therapist? You know what? I, um, I, I do. And I just got referred back because I have these ruptured discs in my spine, but I am getting much better now about recognizing when my internal muscles get tight, much, much better. Really? Oh God. Yeah. I can tell. And man, it's all about using the wand. Oh, I've never, I don't know about that. Well, you have to learn. Don't be afraid of it. You got to learn it. I mean, she, no, she, nobody told me about that. Well, talk to, talk to her about that. You know, maybe she, oh. just, maybe she just doesn't think you're ready yet, but um, the, these oh. are the glass one. They, they can be straight or angled. The angled one is better. I'm in my opinion. It scares me. No, <laughs> girl, it's your body. Is, I know. is sex scary? No. Okay. Well, it, now it is. <laughs> okay, I know, but if so, it, I mean, a, a big penis in there is going to be much more traumatic than this little thing, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, let's be honest here. Your vagina yeah. it, 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 it welcomes structures. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> and so, look, you can see that with this, it really allows you. <laughs> It allows you to touch these muscles. See this? See how wow. I'm able to go the length of the muscle? It's kind uh-huh. of a it's kind of a J shape. These wow. are this is fabulous, but it takes time. I mean, when I first got these, I was just like trying. It's an interesting first experience. Well, and I you know <laughs> I do it in the morning or before I go to bed. You oh. know, and um. I didn't get it. I didn't, I didn't really understand the anatomy, you know? And so I kept talking to the physical therapist cause I was just pushing it in there and touching things and it wasn't yeah. making sense. And she kept saying it's a J shape. And I was like, I don't understand the J shape, but when you, uh-huh. when you look at this, if you were to put this on its side, it is a J shape. See, there's the short J and then the long part of the J. And okay. so you, this is about you gaining some confidence and knowledge in your body. And the fact that you have adhesions, uh, you know, you're going to be trying to figure out where those adhesions are and gently massaging them. And, you know, wow. don't be afraid of your body. Your body is a miracle. You just right. have to, you have to, you have to learn it right now. Mm-hmm. Right, right now you're, you're just, it's, it's all new. Um, yeah. So anyway, hon, I'm extremely hopeful for you. Oh I, God, I'm glad you are. I need to be more hopeful. Okay. But in the meantime, I need you to do your guided relaxations. We got to carry hope in your heart every day. You can tell mm-hmm. by my office, my office is filled with a lot of happy things. Yeah. Right. Um, and that yeah. was huge for me. 
uh, absolutely huge for me was to get out of my dark room, open the shade, open the drapes, start That's reading. That's the first thing I do in the morning. Yeah. Open all the windows. I love the sun. Yeah, me too. Me I'm in too. the office. It's dark in here right now because I don't yeah. want my husband listening to me. Yeah. <laughs> Susan, well, listen, you're up where I am. Technically, I'm your support group leader because I'm the support group leader for California, too, or at least yeah. Northern California. So you can you can reach out to me and be happy to talk with you offline, too. OK, if I need to do that, how do I do that? Uh, phone numbers right on our website. Oh, you just call an so 800 sweet. number 1-800-928-7496. OK, I appreciate it. OK, hon. Big hug to you. Big hug to um, you. You girl, you're tough. You have never been more prepared to deal with whatever happens oh my to you. God. Now listen. Oh, I just thought of one thing. Colonoscopy, is that is that prep gonna be painful? No, you know, I, have, make you drink that? I have a whole set we have a whole blog on our website on colonoscopy okay. preps. Don't freak out about it. You I'm got like, it. Oh my god, I'm afraid to do a colonoscopy. No, <laughs> you don't need to be afraid of doing colonoscopy. It's, it's fine. Okay, I just thought maybe the just the, read the blog on our website about it, okay? Okay. okay. All right. Hon. I appreciate you so much. Thank you. You are very <laughs> welcome. All right. Thank you. You have never, bye bye. you have never been more prepared to deal with whatever happens to you than you are at this very moment because you are oh truly one you. day older and one Thank day you. wiser. Okay. Thank you so much. All right, Donna, my friend, Donna. Thank you. I am <laughs> wonderful. I can hear you. I am good. Hi, baby. How are you? <laughs> right back. You right know, back this, is a, this is the only time I can get a chance to see you and give you hugs. You know that, right? I know. I know. What? And talk to my IC family. You know, this is the only time I can do it. So I don't want to keep you too long. But, I, you know, it's funny because, you know, how 2020 was so off. I mean, well, I speak for myself. It was just the most one of the most stressful years of my life. Oh, God. And yeah. I thought, you know, what can I do for 2020? As an IC patient, what can I do for myself for 2021? Okay. And you know, when you were holding up the books, I kept thinking to myself, Donna, why don't you just in retrospect, just for a little while, go back to five years ago when you first were diagnosed with IC and see how far you've come. And Jill, you know, I have killed I got the books of the interstitial cystitis solution when I was first diagnosed. I got ending pelvic pain. I got the vagina Bible. I got the chronic, I mean, this is one of the most wonderful resources, the chronic pelvic pain. That's just a, a tremendous resource for all of us. So I encourage my IC family to get these books. Look, go, you know, go online. And I'm not just saying this to say it. I'm saying it as an authentic I see patient who, for me, I have come such a long way that all these books that Jill talks about, all the books that I have, they're such tremendous resources. In any case, whether you're learning something new or not, and I've been, I, and, and trust me, I started from the very top of the urology chart and I worked my way all the way down. I did every single step. Pain. I mean, I was in so much pain. Sometimes I couldn't even think, but I still <laughs> wanted to check all those boxes because I wanted to have some. I wanted to have some solace and integrity for myself to know that I did all the things I should do. So when I would go to my physicians, I would say, "This is what I've done. I did every single solitary thing I was supposed to do." Where do we go from here? Right, and I remember right. telling Jill, Jill, when you talked about sometimes you have to step back and revisit the whole entire diagnosis. Right. I went into, mm -hmm. I did exactly that. After a certain point, I just went into my, 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 my physicians and I said, I said, forget about that I have IC. I want you to start from day one as though I didn't even have it. And let's from there. And right now I'm, Hey, do I have pain? I do every now and then. When Jill talked about rectal pain, oh my God, yes, I do. If there's anything in there over two days, forget about it. I'm going, oh my God. Do you know what I mean? I, I get that. And we're talking about when she talks about those chronic overlapping issues. I, I get all that. But the reason why my IC family that I do get it is because I've read these books. Yeah. I take them to my physicians. I have purchased them for my physicians. I tell them, if you work with me, if I'm working to, 
hard to do the things that I'm supposed to do, then it's up to you to help me and work with me on these things because we're supposed to be in it together. Well, and I don't want to be I don't want to be 85 years old and still, you know, in so much pain that I can't do anything. I said it's incumbent upon my physicians. I tell them it's incumbent upon you to bring you resources. And I want to let you know that this is what I'm doing. I'm doing my part. When Jill puts out those IC magazines, guys, I take those into my physicians and I give them to, to I say, here, this is what I read. Would you like to read it? And especially during IC Awareness Month, I do that. And, and we go and I pick out an article so that we can go through one of those articles because Right. You know, a lot of time when you're going into your physician's office. So I just choose an article and I say, this is what I think pertains to me in terms of what I'm talking about right. today. Right. And I look at 2021, guys, and I'm not going to hold you too much longer, but I look at 2021 and Jill does the research. She is the one right now that is doing all of that hard work for us as IC patients that we may not get the opportunity to do. Not right. that we can't do it. It's just that she's doing that part of it. And I think for 2021, as she comes across with all of these amazing resources, all the things we're doing when we talk about we can do with our brains to retrain our brains to deal with the pain, how we can empower ourselves to do all of the things that we can do. We have such... The body, like Jill said, the body is amazing. And if we just sit back, take some time and rethink and re-empower ourselves like we know we can, I believe we as IC patients can do so much better. And so going into 2021, I just want to give encouragement to all of my IC family to say, Decide what you want to do for 2021. Listen, guys, it's 2021. It's not 1989. And I, Jill, I'm not trying to date you at all, but I know you've had it for a long time. My God, I said I'm like 1980. I should have just said 1980, whatever. But I'm not, I'm just saying we've come so far. So, so, so what? Okay. So, far, guys. So, oh, lady, oh my gosh. We've so, come so far. Okay. So, so what, so what you're trying to say, but I think one of the points you're trying to say to other people is if there's room for improvement, if you're getting better, if you're getting worse rather than better, if you're not responding to therapy, it's time to take a step back and learn a little bit more about what some of the other options are. It's a new year. And, yes, it is. and you know, and, and the other thing, too, is I think we have to face our biases here. There are a lot of women out there who and men who will simply not do pelvic floor work at all because they're too embarrassed mm -hmm. by it. And the reality is, is if the if your muscles are driving your symptoms and you're unwilling to do it, it's your fault. You have, yes. we have got yes. to work on those muscles. So we've got to address those fears and, and legitimately there are people who've been abused and it's very hard for them. And yes. then we're going to start externally, but don't let fear stop anybody yes. and don't yes. let somebody demean you stopping this. If a doctor, if a doctor says, uh, I'm giving up on you, it's like, thank you for your service. That's I would right. like to go see somebody with a little bit more experience. Don't take that stuff personally in That's any right. way, shape, or form. There, if there, you have exceeded on our website about local doctors, regional doctors, national doctors. That's right. Local doctors, an IC patient will overwhelm a local, a local doctor very, very quickly. They usually send you to a regional doctor. But some of you have cases that will overwhelm a regional doctor and you've got to get yourself to a national doctor. And that's why having Chris Payne so close, mm -hmm. it's so important to pursue that, to get a fresh look at that body, you know? So thank you, Donna. You are. Hey, I just, you know, I, like I said, I don't, I don't, you know, and, and like I said, I'm, I'm, I have, I say, I do. And I have bold, I have little dinner. I do. But I just think that, you know, I try to keep a positive attitude, even when the pain can be very, very difficult. However, I can't fault right now my physicians because they're all working with me. They're all saying to me, we'll figure it out. We'll do it together. And I just, I would just encourage all of you to, to, do, to, 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 to press them, to challenge them and to challenge yourselves as far as knowledge is concerned, because 
It's on the IC network. And girl, my God, Jill's got so much stuff mm-hmm. on there. I don't even know. Sometimes I, hey, I'm still going on the network, going and rereading things because there's so there's a plethora of information that is just absolutely outstanding. And I really appreciate her being here every every third Sunday, sometimes in between, whenever she can get there, whenever California. I, I try to get here. Thing I know. With, yeah. the, with the fires and whenever my Jill, my Jilly stays healthy too, you know. <laughs> hey, hey, shout out to you, Jilly, for being healthy too. You've got to stay healthy for us too. You know what I mean? I, okay. I, I, know, I know, baby. I know. I know. So I'm here to give you hugs. You know what I mean? You stay healthy. Baby, well, too. I'm getting my new in a week. Hey, I, I got I, mine too. I got, I had some cracks and I'm sharing guys. I did. I honestly, I did. And it looks great. It I, does. I, anyway, cra- I'm I fractured go, I'm both of my teeth. So to give all of my icy family a hug and tell you that I love all of you. And Jill, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here for us. And you and There's I, not a lot listen of you out there, baby. There's only one of you. Okay. In the next month, you and I have to sit down and we got to go over your pain again. And yes. I, I, I want to do a fresh look with you at your pain too. See if we can find anything else missing. Okay. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thank you, ladies. Thank okay. You. See, you, Love you. Love see you, you soon. <laughs> Love you. Love you. Okay. So um, we've got three more. And for people on Facebook and YouTube, we're in our Zoom meeting right now. I posted the link. Let me just post the link again. Uh, Pavan on YouTube says, what is the difference between overactive bladder and IC? Oh, I see it, there's pain involved. The, a, a, a new set of nerves is involved, whereas with uh, overactive bladder, it's usually just frequency urgency. Okay. Um, let me, um, Mary's near Sacramento. So Mary, you got some options here, hon. All righty, here, hold on a sec. So anybody in Facebook, if y'all want to come on over to Zoom, feel free. I'm going to come back to Zoom here for a moment. Um, Anne, I'm looking at a beautiful snow-covered field. Are you there, Anne? I am here, but I'm in my PJs, and I'm not going to show my face. That's okay. Okay. <laughs> How are you okay. doing today? Okay, so I waited three months, and I've... Um, had some issues in the past, and I went to Urogyno this week. Okay. I had to wait three months for the appointment. He was extremely, extremely thorough, but when I got home, I kind of reevaluated everything, and I, I, I don't know. Um, so I thought, uh, a couple weeks ago, I, ha- I thought I had an IC flare, and in one breath, he did a pelvic floor exam like you had mentioned. Okay. But he told me that, you know, he couldn't make the assumption on one visit, but he didn't think that I had IC because I don't have any pelvic pain. So in one breath, he said that in another breath, he told me that um, if I get a flare, whatever I had again, that I could go up and get a bladder installation. Well, okay. So, so, okay. So hon, just wait a second. Um, before we talk about treatments, we have to understand anatomy. So what did he say about your pelvic floor? Okay, well, he knows that I had gone um, for pelvic floor therapy. Okay. And um, I'm going to go, I'm going back again. And I do use a wand at home. And he knows who I go to because they're very far and few, few in my area. And he gave me a prescription because I told him I want to go again. Okay. I was going for so, urgency. so, okay. So are your pelvic floor muscles tight? Yes. Okay. She, that's why I went. Okay. Okay. So we know your pelvic floor muscles are messed up. Right. And how old are you? 64. Okay. And so how about the quality and health of your skin? Uh, are you, are you going, are you showing any signs of dryness and estrogen atrophy? Yes, I, I'm going to probably end up going on estrogen, but I have to get an endometrial polyp removed. Okay. And they don't want to really put me on it right now until they do that or, or whatever they need to do. So he diagnosed me as having an overactive bladder okay. and wanted to push medicine, which I, I don't feel comfortable taking because I know I have to take it for the rest of my life. 
I, I thought that, that was, I have Noctoria at night. I go four times and he didn't like that. And but it, I was really shocked that he didn't think I had IC and he's terming the diagnosis as an overactive bladder because I have pressure and urgency. Well, I have to, I don't understand your body enough to give you a good opinion right now. I, I, I'm having your body right now. So help me, let's just take a step back for a moment. And I want to try to understand a little bit more about your pelvis okay. as a whole. Okay. So we know your muscles, we know your muscles are involved. And at the, how long, I mean, how long have you had symptoms again? Well, I, I, I started with like urgency as a little kid, but I never, per, I never, uh, you know, as a child or late in my teens and, and I never commented on, like all my UTIs come out negative. And, okay. So, um, so you had what you thought were UTIs for, yes. for throughout your life and often came back negative for infection, correct? Yeah. yeah. Do you have IBS? Nope. Vulva Not that I'm aware of. Do you have vulvodynia? What, I don't know. What is that? It feels like you have a yeast infection, but your vulva looks normal. Uh, no, I had it once and it was only through bouts of tons of antibiotics uh, from different doctors saying that I had and demanding me demanding antibiotics and, and, and they just gave it to me to rush me out of there. And okay. I got yeast. Do, do you have TMJ? Um, no, I'm a dental. I, I wear a night guard. Um, okay. I, well, if you I, wear a night guard, then you grind your teeth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you, do, does your uh, no. Okay. Do you have a fibromyalgia muscle pain? Are you struggling with muscle pains? No. Okay. Um, headaches? No. Eye pain? No. Okay. So the question then is, why would you have had frequency urgency as a child? And uh, do, so do you have one leg longer than the other? I don't know. I was never diagnosed. So, you, well, your physical, so your physical therapist should do that. Have her measure your legs. Because there is a chance that maybe you have a... Um, yeah, a bone, what we call a bony structure abnormality that began as you were growing. Maybe you do have one leg that's a quarter of an inch, a half an inch, not quite a half an inch, but the one leg that's longer than the other that's been messing with your ability to walk from day one. That's an interesting piece of this puzzle. Um, were you in any accidents when you were a kid? Do they were car accidents? Were you hit by a car? Anything at all like that? Uh, when I was 22, I was hit by a motorcycle. Okay. Well, that's important. That's crit trauma is important. We have to understand the impact of trauma. Um, so you don't have pain. You just have frequency urgency, correct? Well, when I had that flare about two months ago, uh, it was so bad. I was going to end up going to the hospital. It was like a razor. It was the worst up into my, I didn't know if it was vaginal or urethral, Okay, but it was really, really bad. They gave uh, the urologist, not the urogyno, my urologist gave me urobel and it, it didn't even work for me, but it was beyond, I never had anything like that in my life. And I do kind of sort of follow the I diet because I was told by another urogyno that I did have IC because it's really hard to diagnose and yeah. they termed me as having it according to my symptoms. So that's why I went for pelvic floor therapy from the get-go. Well, if you have pain as your bladder fills with urine that is relieved by urination, so the fuller you get, the worse you feel. But once you yeah. empty your bladder, there's a sense of relief. That's your bladder wall. No, so, I don't have no pain. Well, then, so... Just so flare was beyond control. Yeah. So, so I don't think, I mean, I think that they're right. You, you don't have the symptoms that we normally associate with an, right. in, with an injured bladder wall. You do have some symptoms associated with an injured muscle. Is sitting painful for you? 
Uh, sometimes I get a little, a little discomfort on my right okay. by my hip, but I okay. So that's now. what you got to explore with your physical therapist. I'm telling you guys, it's the little pain, the little weird thing that happens every now and then that often solves this whole thing. You think about oh, the man. little weird symptoms that you have. That pain on the right side is important. Tell your, physical, tell your physical therapist about that and see if she can understand what that is. That's interesting. Okay? Well, uh, do you believe, so I don't want to start taking medicine. What are your feelings on um, uh, pumpkin seed extract? I just started taking Ooh. it today. I'm not well, a med. Why would person. you do, what, what, what are you trying to accomplish with that? Frequency. It's but so why, why has- would you even think that that would help frequency? I read up on it. I thought maybe it would. Uh, they, oh, I'm on groups and they say that it really, really helps because they, I don't want to go four times at night. I but it's learn. not, it's not the critical, it's not the critical ingredient you need. Your frequency is coming either from the alpha afferent nerve in your bladder wall, or it's coming from tight muscles or it's coming. Well, you know, and or it can be coming, it can be started by estrogen atrophy. And you are at the age where you are going to start seeing estrogen atrophy. That is just real. It's going, it. it's going to happen. So let's just, so let's, let's posit two theories here. Let's just say that you've got significant estrogen atrophy in your bladder wall. I do. Okay. And so your bladder can't defend itself from whatever's in your urine. So the number one cause for nighttime urination is irritation from food. So are you following the IC diet? Not to a T, I'm having coffee. Well, girl, seriously, that's, that's, that's the, I'm I'm doing the best I can. I know, but, but you, uh, you have to stop the coffee. Stop the coffee for two months and let's see if that changes your symptoms. I bet it will. Here, I mean, think about it this way. You're stuck in a loop. Wouldn't it be sad if this was all just because of estrogen atrophy and you drinking coffee and here you're starting to take meds. You're looking for medicine to fix this. Medicine will never fix that coffee irritation. Right. And as long as you're doing the coffee, you're, you're messing with the nerves and that's going to drive the frequency urgency. At night, even though it doesn't do it as, in the day? Yes, absolutely. Because during the day, you have distractions that at night you don't have. You know, we had a, a big, one, the, I think the last big IC meeting, of, uh, and all the international group IC groups were there along with all the doctors. And this whole cup of coffee every day came up. And we all went, absolutely, the patients who suffer the most with long-term pain, so the people who drink one cup of coffee a day. Because you're literally not giving your bladder and the nerves in your bladder a chance to heal. As long as you're poking it with coffee and and coffee, you're poking it two ways. You're poking it with the acid of the coffee combined with a caffeine, which is like a a sledgehammer to the nerves. Right. right. So, so, you know, I've told this story before. I was working with this lady in New York who, you know, she called me with symptoms just like you, just like you, spent a lot of time with her, went through the diet. I'll never forget her because she had kind of a very different voice. It was a very, very strong, a strong voice, very memorable voice. And she calls me five years later. She's, she's doing well. She says, Jill, help me. Nobody will help me. I'm just getting worse and worse. And so we talk about her symptoms. She was having absolute bladder wall symptoms. And I said, are you following the diet? She goes, Yes. And her husband was on the phone. He goes, are you kidding? She doesn't follow the diet. She drinks a pot of coffee a day and a six pack of a Diet Coke every single day. And she in five years had spent $50,000 on therapies, none of which worked for her. And I said to her, I said, do you realize you've sabotaged every therapy that you've ever tried? And she's like, what? And I went, nothing could have worked with you with that level of acid. There's no therapy that can counteract the damage done by what she was doing. And hers was extreme, but you're in the same situation. I was trying to figure out what happened that three weeks ago or three, two months ago that I had such terrible, uh, what I had that they're saying it's not, I see them. What the heck was it? It wasn't a UTI. Well, I don't it, know what... it, estrogen atrophy. All of a sudden it just came on. Yes. Yes. There comes a point. 
there comes a point when you're it's a it's a different it's a different time for everybody where your estrogen levels drop to the point that you now feel pain. It's like the straw. It's like the straw that broke the camel's back. Oh, yeah, you man. hit that point where finally your bladder simply couldn't defend itself. And so my guess would be, and this is a guess. I right. can't. Uh, my job is to give you options and to right, explain right. context here. I think you have missed a really important piece of this because you are drinking coffee every day. You got to lose the coffee for like two to three months and give your bladder an opportunity to heal and the nerves to calm down. Okay. Mm -hmm. You have well, to do it. I don't do want it. to do a cold turkey. So I don't, cause well, I don't how much, I okay. Be, now, now be truthful here, Matt. How much coffee are you drinking a day? I was two, but now I'm done down to three quarters. Okay. So you're, you're doing, you're making progress. Yeah. So um, if you can get yourself down to a half in a week, and then take mm -hmm. another 10 days and get your dance self down to a quarter in a week. Mm -hmm. And just, and then you'll be down to a teaspoon a day and you'll get yourself off of it. But this is about creating an environment that will support healing. And we've right. got to give the bladder time to calm down and heal. And you can't go back two weeks later and do it again. Nothing happens in two weeks. It takes two weeks for one urothelial cell to be replaced. You got to give it a couple of months to really get things to calm down. Okay. And so, man, do camel. Think, uh, the estrogen, do you think estrogen helps urgency and frequency too? No, if estrogen will not help urgency frequency. As what estrogen will do is it will help your bladder produce more mucus. But okay. that is not a substitute for losing the irritant. Okay. Listen, 20 years from now, you're not going to be able to drink much coffee anyway. You're getting older. You and I are getting older. It sucks. Right. <laughs> you know, and, and, I, you know, I didn't, my, my issues with, with estrogen started at the age of 51 and my doctor gave me the estrogen cream. I didn't use it because in my brain, I'm 25 years old. Me too. Me too. Same and thing here. I threw them all out. They were all expired. I know. And it's, imp it's impossible. It was impossible for me to accept the fact that I had an age related issue. Now I really understand it. And it's no right, shame to right. it. It's real. Right. I, all I can say is I'm just glad I'm past going through menopause and all the drama with that because that reverse puberty sucks. It's hard. Right. So right. Right. anyway, okay, hon, listen, I'm getting that's towards the end, so I'm going to have to run, but okay. Okay. That's, that's really true. what, what you need to, in my opinion, what you should consider doing. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, hon. All right. So I have got Lisa and Ursula Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch a tiger by a toe. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. All right. So, Lisa and Ursula, hang out. You are last, but not Hi. least. All Jill, right. It's been a while since I've seen you. Yeah. How are you doing? You look beautiful. Oh, thank you. Um, I just have to say, I went to see Dr. Margolis, who was on the IC network. Okay. Yes. Okay. And we've got to get, we've got to get rid of them. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we can't talk about this online. We yeah. have to talk offline. So okay, don't say anything else with a name. Okay. Okay. Um, so what it turns out is I was originally diagnosed with Hunter's lesions. Yes. And when I went to see the new practitioner, yes. my old practitioner did not have pictures. So I went in assuming that I had it. He made a big deal when he did my cystoscopy. I was awake for it in the office. He brought everybody in to see the lesions and they did an ultrasound in the office and I am filled with kidney stones. Filled oh, 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 blocking the ureters. Ooh. So, right? So they rushed me to a CAT scan. And not only that, I have, I have a birth defect. I have two ureters on each side. Wow. Right, right. And so they have find hydronephrosis on the right kidney. So it took some time to get me into surgery because of COVID. But what was interesting is new practitioner was kind of like, basically like game over with the bladder, this solves it all. And I'm like, okay. And so he went in and, and this was like at the first appointment. So they did the cystoscopy. And they were going to do it. They had a break. There was so much going on. They did one procedure just to clean out the ureters. Okay. And then they put the dents in. Okay. And then procedure number two was to clean out the kidneys. 
put stents in and procedure three was to get the stents out. Okay. So uh, after that, I ended up having a flare. And I, first of all, having that all cleared out just changed everything for me. Yay. Um, it's been a, a drastic, drastic change. But I still, I've had a flare since then. Okay, cool. I go back in for my follow-up. And he basically was like, well, you know, I've looked at your bladder. There's nothing there. And I'm like, I gotcha. But, you know, I went through menopause at 37. You know, I know my, I'm, I'm getting ready to see a new functional medicine doctor because I will not take Premarin. I will only do bioidenticals. So I'm in process and he would not do a pelvic floor exam like you, TMJ, fibromyalgia, migraines, the whole shebang for like ever and ever. I can't imagine that I don't have pelvic floor dysfunction. And he just was like, nope, pretty much problem solved. See you in six months. Well, okay. So, so again, that's one of the challenges with, with with specialists is they don't play outside their own sandbox. That's a urologist who's playing in his sandbox, a urinary tract, and he's not, he's, he's not comfortable going beyond that. Why don't you go to your, but the reality is, is with the amount of stones you had, your pain had to be insane. I'm sure your muscles are tight. I mean, well, it, that's the whole thing too, because being a chronic pain patient for now coming up on 26 years, yeah. my pain tolerance is crazy. Yeah. So even when I went for the CAT scan and you know, the techs normally don't say anything. The woman came in and I was like, how have you been like handling this? Uh, and I'm like, I don't know. I have slight scoliosis in the spine. I've had lower back pain for, I don't know, ever. It just didn't even blip to me. Did they tell you what kind of stones they were? Um, one was calcium two types of calcium and the others, they were different compositions. Okay. And, really, and did they, so you're not taking pre-leaf, right? No. Well, he took me off. Not only did he say nothing, he said, don't even follow the diet anymore. I was a little shocked, but I mean, it was almost like, um, he, when he found the kid, like no one else, this is like my third doctor in 10 years. This is the first doctor to check my kidneys. Yeah. So it was almost like I found this, therefore problem solved. Well, and yeah, I can, I can see that, but you know, I think, um, uh, number one, I would want to know why, why am I throwing stones? That would be number exactly. one. I asked that question and then, and then I said to him, well, do I have kidney disease or not? Because my CAT scan result says hydronephritis and he didn't know. And I'm thinking, Okay, now we're out of his wheelhouse. I need to get to a nephrologist now for this portion. Yeah, program. I think so. I think that that, right. that makes total sense. But let's go back to the book. Like, so instead of living in eight to 10 land, now we're down, you know, five. My pain level's manageable for me. Yeah. But he was kind of like, oh, game over. See you in six months. Well, I'm like, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. But what about, okay, I may not. Now, I don't know how this is. Either my old doctor is a complete whatever or I'm a miracle of God because he did not have pictures, my old doctor, of my bladder. So I couldn't show new doctor my bladder, but he swears looking at these two cystoscopies, they did two with the procedures. My bladder looks good. There is no lesions. Good. So, okay. That just, but I was like, okay, that's that one. What about the other ones? I'm having burning. I'm having pain. My pain level's gone down drastically, but we're not done here. And he was kind of like, well, it's much less now. So why don't you, why don't you go to your OBGYN and see, and have a pelvic floor assessment from your OBGYN well, and see if they'll send actually, that to you. I will, I'm not going back to that OBGYN because he was treating me for IC and he also did not test my pelvic floor. So I'm finding new doctors. Okay. Okay. Um, I think I should find a Eurogyne actually. I mean, I'm right. I'm right outside of New York City um, in northern New Jersey. So um, there's there's enough people around here to okay. find somebody. But okay. Well, I mean, just... I don't I don't see how you couldn't have tight muscles with all the pain you had from the stones. And That's so what I'm I think you're right. And I think getting that checked would be a very, very good thing, hon. But I mean, yeah. I, but see, you are living proof that there's tremendous diversity in this patient population. Oh, and, absolutely. And That's 
the, the re- that, you, know, you got to keep at it. I've been at it now. We're going on 10 years right. and, um, you know, it's a slow game, but you just keep pounding at it. And I was just surprised too, when I was talking about the five subtypes, you could tell he had that glazed over look. And, and I, tell you, saying, I, but I looked at your bladder and there's nothing there. And, and so you, just, you like, wouldn't even fit that subtyping system. I mean, be, right? be, you wouldn't even fit in that subtyping system because because stones are not part of an IC diagnosis. Oh, no, I understand that. Yeah. And if I had the surgery and like all was well in the world, cool. But no, all is not well in the world. Right. I've, I've had a flare since that was just, you know, same thing. Um, okay. Well, I so we're unraveling the, uh, or we're going through the layers. So you've gotten through one yeah. layer. Now your next layer is your muscles. So keep at it, hon. Keep at so it. So do you think I, I should go to a gynecologist or go to a urologist? Whoever will see you and just put their finger in your VJJ and touch your muscles. <laughs> okay. Right? Um, I also need to talk to you privately about my mem- something I messed up with my membership. Okay. Should I just give you a call sometime? Yeah, like on Tuesday. Uh, tomorrow's my day off. So Tuesday okay. Tuesday or anytime this week, I'm not going anywhere. So COVID's really so- bad. So I'm literally not leaving the house. Okay. I will call you on Tuesday and you're California, right? Yeah. Okay. And is there somebody in the New York area? That's, I remember when I was coming to meetings, there was a girl, I can't remember. You know, we have a list of support groups, but a lot of the old support groups are gone. So I don't know. I haven't talked to anybody in New York recently. So all right, hon. Okay. 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 Have a good one. You too. All right. Ursula, we're saving the best for last. Thank you for your (laughs) patience. Thank you. How are you, hon? How is life? Um, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you uh, for, for talking to me. You're very um, welcome. I, I talked to you once before, um, some time ago, and one of the things um, that you suggested was that I see a public floor therapist and I've done that. I also have seen a Euro gynecologist. Um, I've had problems for, oh my gosh, um, I don't know, probably 20, 25, 30, maybe 30 years. Okay. With um, urgency and um, frequency, but I have worked on my diet really hard. Like I've given up caffeine and alcohol, spicy food, and that has helped quite a lot. Um, and I did see that I think that the public floor therapy is um, helping. Okay. She seems to know what she's doing. She felt like my um, public floor was very tight. And she also felt like my entire system was sort of like on fight or fight or flight, you know, very, on um, very high stress level. Right. Um, so, but the one thing so she, she's been doing a lot of external work, like, you know, on pressure points. And she kind of, she describes it like she's peeling back the layers of an onion with my body. She's even doing some things up here, the back of my neck. Good. I carry a lot of tension up here in the back of my neck. I do too. And I like to walk a, a lot and I get this like pain up here. Yeah. And then sometimes a lot of lower back pain. Yeah. So like today... I went walking um, on a hike and I was able to go, you know, how sometimes I, right when I first started out, I already have a lot of pain and I can kind of push through it and it gets a little better and sometimes it gets worse. But today I was able to walk like about four miles and I felt pretty good Okay. when I got home. But as soon as I got home and I sat down in the chair, it's the sitting Okay. It really bothers me. Okay, so I so I want pain. you to I want you to stand up right now and tell me what happens with the pain. Okay. Um, let me see if I can do it. You want me to show you? Is that what you Yeah, mean? yeah. Stand up. Okay. Well, and then one other thing, I don't know if this let me just real quick tell you. So she has me doing some exercises. And one of the exercises, it seemed like it made things a lot worse. Okay. Uh, Okay, so and it was like she has me doing this low squat where like I hold on to like a doorknob or like a railing and I squat down really low. I don't know if I can do this. Okay, no, no, but don't do that first. The first thing I want to know is you stood up. Did that improve your pain? When you stood up, did your pain get improved? 
Yes, it did. Okay. And I seem to feel the pain. It's like on my pelvic bone, kind of on the side, on the external, but then I get burning too. Okay. So what, so, so what I think you have are trigger points up in your groin. Okay. And, and um, I mean, that's what that kind of suggests, but so I want you to have her look at that a little bit more um that's a great thing you, you need this book if you don't have this i love it i have that book okay so good and yeah and it's wonderful so i do um it's awesome and i'm still kind of reading it i mean i'm reading it like there's there's a lot of um you know there's a lot to absorb oh my <laughs> i i've read the book twice now and i and I, there's yeah. still so much to absorb it's i mean it took him 15 years to write it so it's pretty amazing <laughs> Um, uh, I know I held up that picture and on the trigger points. Um, I totally understand that about walking now. So like for me, so, um, let's see, how can I say this? Uh, mm, so I've always been a gym rat. Like I, 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 I get happiness and joy walking and working out yeah me too and that's kind of something i'm a, a little upset about i'm right. so sorry if i interrupted you because i used to like six no maybe three years ago i ran a 10k right and i i went and had a beer afterwards and i mean it probably kept me awake but i was able to do those things yeah but and i'm like right now i don't think i could run up the block okay but game, but like, how old are you now how, how old are you now 54. So understand your muscles are changing as we get older and you are in, you're in perimenopause now, if you, if you're not through it. I'm in menopause now. And he looked at my um, yeah. skin tone down there and he said he thought it looked good, but oh. I did get um, some estrogen. I haven't tried it yet. Though. Okay. I was a little worried about taking it on. Why? What are you worried about? Well, I mean, the, you know, when you read all the information, there's all these like cancer warnings and stuff on there. So uh, I want you to Google topical estrogen safety. Okay. Topical estrogen is considered much, much safer than oral estrogen. Using that okay, little bit, know it is, so little bit on your you. skin is considered okay. pretty safe. And, okay. and so you're, 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 you're at the point that I was at a couple of years ago where your body, our bodies change so dramatically with menopause and some of those muscles get a little bit weaker. So what was happening to me is every time I was going to the gym, it's, I felt like I was hurting myself every day. Yeah, me too. And I just like, and I just couldn't figure it out. It's like, and so one of the things, so I used to do Stairmaster. I'm not doing that for my pelvic floor. Then I switched to elliptical. Mm -hmm but I was getting a lot of tension in my thighs. So then I would go over to the, the treadmill and the treadmill hit, hurt the worst. The mm. longer I walked, the worse the tension got. And I said that to my, I finally went to a sports physical therapist and he is the guy who really helped me. And he said, that's okay. because you should never walk on a flat treadmill. You need to walk with a little elevation, like 5%. Oh, that that okay. change, it changes okay. everything about how you use your it. muscles down there. Okay. That's good to know. Yeah. I actually ordered a treadmill. Um, we have a gym at work, but with COVID, I, I don't want to go in there right now. And um, you have to wear a mask. And yeah. Uh, but the funny thing is they ordered a treadmill because I thought, well, if I'm at home and I need to pee, <laughs> I can just run in the bathroom. Right. And right. keep going. But she also has me trying to do a little bit of water training. And I have a question for you about yeah. that. You know, like trying to hold it a little bit longer. Yeah. To, to not constantly be going every minute when I feel like I have to go. Yeah. And is that, it, it goes against kind of your gut, you know? Like, is that a good thing or a bad, bad thing to do? No, it's I good. I mean, bladder training, it, you know, your bladder is a muscle. Here, I'm raising, I, I've been you, sitting sitting yeah. for a long period of time so i'm yeah i'm gonna stand now too you've been sitting a long time i know it seems to be, be helping well Can I ask you one other question okay well let me just get to bladder training so so oh, so remember that your bladder is a muscle 
And mm -hmm. after trauma, like uh, if you were drinking a lot of coffee, eventually the muscle gets a bit irritated and it starts to mm -hmm. kind of get smaller and smaller. It loses its ability to expand. And so it gets okay. smaller and smaller. And so bladder training is a really easy way of slowly but gently stretching that muscle and improving that capacity. Okay. So, but it's never done if you're in pain. It's pointless for you to hold it if you're in pain because we're then right. turning all those nerves on and that doesn't make any sense at all. Okay. So I, I, the bladder training is viable. I mean, the pelvic floor therapy, I think is really, really important. I would keep doing that. Yeah. And talk to her more, be much more involved in that process of what she's touching. Yeah, I'm really and, excited about it. I yeah. feel like she's kind of on to, it's going to help me, I think. Oh, I think she will too. Okay, what's your other question? Um, so the other thing is, though, the doctor has, I was getting up sometimes four and five times a night, and I was just miserable because quality of life, you know. But the doctor put me on, and I don't like to take drugs if I don't have to, right? But he did put me on this desmopressin, which is for basically like kids that have, wake up at night to go pee, you know, that pee in their beds. Okay. For nocturia and, um, and bedwetting. But what it does is it inhibits your ability to produce urine um, for like six to eight hours. And I've been taking it and it, and it, I don't know. And it seems to be helping me, but I don't really like to take it. So, I mean, I would like to try to get off of it. I mean, this is probably a question for the doctor. I know. Yeah. But I'm hoping the PT will help me enough where maybe I can stop taking it. But I am sleeping almost through the night or waking up just once. Okay. Oh, well, that's um, good. Yeah, which is amazing. But when I have to go to work... Yeah. And I, I go to bed early, I have a hard time sleeping and I end up not getting a lot of sleep hmm. and I do work. So I'm like, I do get on weekends and vacations basically, cause I can fall back asleep again and sleep in late. And, yeah. You know. Yeah. I I'm the, I'm the same way. Well, I mean, yeah. I think, I think that the assumption with Desmopressin is that you are just producing too much urine and I don't know any IC doctor who's ever suggested that to be quite honest. I, yeah, and so I, 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 I think your intuition about wanting to try to figure out why you're in, why you're uncomfortable and with those muscles is absolutely the right thing to do. Okay. I mean, and I would just okay. talk to him and say, what, do you have people, women who take this for 20 or 30 years? And it'd be yeah, a real, it's kind of one of those things where, you know, patients often walk into the doctor's office and they just want something. It's just like, give me something, give me anything. Not me, I don't want it. Yeah, but they're yeah. used to, they're trained that way. So yeah, does, right. I so Desmopressin are. just may be his go-to when a woman has yeah. frequency urgency instead of kind of taking that step forward and looking at yeah. those muscles and stuff. And then, oh, I'm sorry. I just don't want to take up too much of your time. I know it's getting late, but just quickly, if I can say one other thing. Yeah. Um, I've, I mean, I, I've listened to you quite a lot and I, I, um, I do also have this other issue with the um, hypersensitivity to like smells and chemicals. Yeah. Um, like I get terrible headaches and ear, throat irritation and my eyes itch and yeah, from chemical, you know, cleaning supplies, perfumes, yeah. it's gotten really bad. Yeah. So it feels like my whole body is just kind of like so hypersensitive to things. And well, I that, what the connection there is. that's IC subtype five central sensitization. It's characterized by having extremely sensitive skin, being drug sensitive or a normal dose of a medication is often too, too, too much for us. We have to take half doses, quarter doses, pediatric yeah. doses. We have a wicked sense of smell. We can smell things that people other, other people can't smell. We can taste things that other people can't taste. Used to tease my one of my boyfriends because I could kiss him at night and tell him exactly everything he'd eaten during the day, and he thought that was <laughs> he thought that was incredibly disgusting. I understand. You know, and so uh, and chemical sensitivity is common. It's nothing. Listen, there's a tremendous gift to being sensitive, and that is you're going to smell the fire and save lives. Yeah. So sensitivity happens. Number, number one, it can be genetic. Uh, and it is certainly genetic in my case. I'm a redhead, you know, common in redheads. You're a blonde. 
Mm -hmm. And we see this more in people of a Northern European descent. You and I are both Northern European. Swedish. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Swedish and Norwegian. Yeah. And so, yeah. <laughs> you know, if we go back 5,000 years and we think about what our ancestors were living in, they were living in a very, very quiet existence in the sense that quiet isn't the right word. I mean, they had limited foods. They were eating, right. they were eating what they could catch, fish, seal, deer. The only fruit they had were berries, maybe apples. There were, there were no citrus. There was no chocolate. There was no caffeine. There was nothing like that. Right, right. All this stuff we put in our bodies. And, and evolutionary adaptation means that species adapt over time. Right. And so the, right. the faster cheetahs survived, the slower ones died. Well, you and I come from an environment where, where literally we had very little exposure to irritants. And, and so being more sensitive is really normal when you are of Swedish descent and Norwegian descent and Finnish descent. It just, mm -hmm. it, it just is yeah, what Norwegian it is. Yeah. And yeah. now we've got, we've got thrown in the fact that with menopause things, our skin becomes even more sensitive. So mm -hmm. there's no, there's, you know, I look at it as being annoying, but also an asset. I mean, my sister is an award-winning winemaker and she's oh, got, great. she's got the same thing. But when she yeah. takes, she tastes wine, she can taste a whole another level of, of ingredients in the wine. Wow. Oh, and I love tasting That's with her. For that job. Yeah. Well, there you go. And yeah. she, and she doesn't swallow a lot, but she just, you know, swirls and spits and she blends wine beautifully. Perfect job for you and I making perfume because we yeah, smell right. so much more. And I'd have a headache the whole time. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. And so I would, uh, you know, I, I, uh, it is what it is. The other time yeah. sensitization happens is after injury or if you're under a lot of stress and you're winding mm -hmm. up your brain with a lot of anxiety, that would also potentially yeah, cause it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But, you know, you're not crazy. It's good. You're going to smell the fire and you're going to save lives. So you think the PT will probably be in, in the diet, those things two together is what I'm thinking will probably be the, uh, the those are the most the, those are the most obvious leads we have right now. Okay. And understand since you're sensitive on your skin, that means your bladder's sensitive too. So no coffee. Your stomach is sensitive, right. your gut is sensitive, your bladder's sensitive. So you gotta do things yeah. that are calming to nerves. So like so um Piora. This is what I take, which is Piora. Oh, I've seen that on the website. Yeah, yeah. I got the bladder builder, but I haven't noticed really any difference. So yeah. maybe that one I should try. Well, it, it, it would be interesting. I mean, bladder builder has okay. PEA in it to it, but this has a bit more. They believe that the active ingredient in, in this palmito ethanolamide is particularly good for nerve pain. Okay. And, and neuropathic okay, driven pain. So, so that okay. might be interesting, you know, but on, um, you know, you're, you're not crazy. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I know I'm not crazy. It's, it's just, it's just, you know, it's just challenging. It's, it's, cha and, and, and you, you know, menopause is, is weird and it changes a lot of stuff and it, it's hard because we feel so young you look mm -hmm. young. I feel, okay. I don't know if I look young, but I feel, I still you feel great. Thank I still yeah. feel, well, honey, if you could only see <laughs> the wrinkles oh, and the Believe skin, <laughs> it's just, that's why I wear the, I was zipping this thing up. That's why I did that. Up. That's <laughs> why I did this one. That's why I did this one. So, but, yeah. but you're there, you know, like I say to a lot of people, you know, there's nothing scary about your presentation. You're not peeing right. blood, you know, you're, you, you, things are, things are at this point in time, really, really logical and not, cons not scary in any way. It, yeah. mu muscle stuff yeah, is, I just, go, go ahead. Oh, no, I mean, I just like to be able to get back to, you know, being able to work out more and being a little more aggressive with my exercise routine. So, I feel like become fragile or something. Well, here, you know? okay. So. The one thing that I did that really helped is I, I 
switched from a traditional pelvic floor specialist to a sports physical therapist. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I, no matter what I was doing with the pelvic floor, I was still having sports problems, workout problems. And, and he helped me more than anybody else. Okay. And being in, so he was the one who could see that I wasn't walking correctly. He was the one who could really pinpoint my SI joint and gave me much better exercises. Like my physical therapist kept saying stretch. And he looked, and he, he was like, he looked at what I was doing. He goes, Oh my God, stop. You should never be okay. doing that. Yoga is not the right thing. The right, right. thing is Pilates. Okay you know, for somebody in your, my, your, my situation, I had so massively yeah. overstretched my muscles that they were barely functioning on well, one I side. Know, that's why it was hurting me doing the, some of those stuff. Well, and, and the yeah, the deep knee bends on, I, cause I have a, I have a bad knee anyway. I, I, I can't do those anymore. I was doing dead bugs. Did you do dead bugs? No. So with a dead bug, you're laying on your back and your arms are up and your legs are up. So you're laying on your back, your legs are up at a right angle and your arms are up and you rotate like this. I know you can't see my mm. feet. Dead bugs are okay. a, a core exercise. And that helps. You know, oh, yeah. Stuff. Yeah. I'll and, look that up then. and then also doing um, Rather than doing deep knee bends, he was having me do reverse planks where I was laying on my back with my knees up and, you know, everything to work on strengthening my, my thighs and all that sort of stuff and improving my core. Okay. My core was very weak too. So okay. think it's so good. Well, you. Yeah. You're an athlete. So you working with a physical therapist who work with other athletes, I think is very important. Yeah, and I've only gone to her a few times, and I think she maybe does have a sports therapy background. So I'll talk to her a little bit more and tell her um, the, about our conversation and that the that one exercise was bothering me. I'll, I'll let oh yeah, know. definitely let her know for sure. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, I really okay. appreciate you. By the way, you, you're amazing. You are very welcome. Make sure you're a member. <laughs> Come on over to our website and become a member and get I, our magazine. I am a member. I just got Yay! your magazine in the mail today. Oh, awesome. I'm so glad yeah, you got I can't it. I can't wait to read it. I'm really proud of this magazine. Yeah. Although I've, <laughs> there's nothing worse than doing a magazine and finding a typo. I did find a typo in my little introduction, but you know, uh -oh. it is what it is. Oh, wow. The wrong apostrophe. We'll forgive you for that. Thank you. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, listen, Lacey, mm -hmm. Ursula, thank you so much. Let's shut down the Zoom meeting. I'm going to head it back over to Facebook and YouTube. Okay. Okay. Be All well. Right, all right, Zoom is shut down. No, I do not want to update it for God's sake. No, hold on. All right, so let me get, get my Facebook back here. See, part of this is like learning your limits. Like what I, I've been sitting for since 1230 and I could starting to feel more rectal discomfort, more tailbone discomfort sitting. So get your ass up out of the chair and do your other stuff right not to swear but you know what we swear we, we're swearing a lot these days so that's going to get better all right so oh no I, if you navigate away from the screen the live video will end no i don't want to end the live video for god's sake kayla says i pulled up the microgen website which test you're supposed to get the urine urinary test Uh, Mary asked an hour ago about the size of the estrogen, hun. I, we can, that's medical advice. You got to talk to your doctor about that. Kyrie says, how do you get the, the blue Urabel stain out of the toilet? I have no idea. Maybe baking soda. I would call the company and ask them. I bet they know. Ingrid says, my doctor is testing me for kidney disease. He says he is 99% sure I have it. Okay. Good. Get the test. Get it checked out. Patsy from Good Fish Lake Nations in Alberta. Welcome. Okay, you guys remember on Facebook, it doesn't let me scroll backwards. So if I've missed your questions, please ask them again. April says, have I seen many other issues as to why I have the IC? So glad there's a support network. Awesome. 
And you guys on Facebook, if you like these meetings, you can give you can give me stars. It's like I'm back in elementary school. I want stars on my report card. Mary says, what's gastroparesis? That's delayed stomach emptying. Food sits in your stomach for a longer period of time and that's it starts to ferment. And then you get a lot of gas on your stomach and you start belching, it sucks. And it's really bad with uh, leafy green vegetables, which I do not eat anymore. And I'm way better because of it. Linda says, I love Dr. Weiss's book, but I wish he shared more exercises. Any books or websites where I can exercise at home? Yes, uh, you can get the exercises from this book, Heal Pelvic Pain, or the book, the book that has a ton of exercises in it is this book, Ending Female Pelvic Pain, and there's also Ending Male Pelvic Pain. All this book is, is exercise after exercise after exercise. Like, really, it's fabulous. Is there a reason for what is Jill's last name? Uh, my last name is Osborne. Thank you, Linda. I'm proud of my last name. I'm an Osborne. Comes from Osborne House in England. The whole drama about my my family on my dad's side. My my grandfather left Sweden, and. Uh, the drama continues. I, won't, I don't need to talk about it here. It's really funny. Somebody's asking about specialists in Texas. Texas, um, the, the place I send a lot of patients to is... Uh, for... Uh, the lady who wrote this book, Dr. Angie Storr, S-T-O-E-H-R, is practicing in, I think in the Dallas area. She is fabulous. And this book is a fabulous for pain management. Great tips in this book. One of her favorite tips in here that I've had to use religiously in the last couple of years is... She talks about the brain and all the processing in the brain and the negative emotions and all that sort of stuff and fight or flight. Um, technique number one, I love this. Use foul language when the pain is intense. <laughs> and she explains why it actually works. I mean, it, it's I. if you need to say the F-bomb, you have my permission to say the F-bomb. Lauren says, I'm sorry I got cut off and don't know if you answered my question about ili iliohypogastric nerve blocks and my doctor doing them, if they helped out or not. He gives them to me every three months and swears by them, but I don't think they're helping and I feel like they've looked me up. Well, I mean, I guess he assumes that you've got a maybe a, a problem with that nerve, maybe a compression of that nerve. I don't know. So Sylvia says, will pre-leaf help with a flare? Sylvia, all Sylvia, what pre-leaf will do is it will alkalinize your urine. Uh, so if your flare is caused by you drinking a cup of coffee, you know, first thing you do when you have a bladder wall driven flare is dilute your urine. So drink water, not a massive amount of water, but let's just try to dilute that urine and try to flush out what you ate that's irritating. The second step is to alkalinize your urine to try to, to compensate for the excess acid. Um, and that's what pre-leaf would do or taking a Tom's or maybe a quarter teaspoon of baking soda and a glass of water. Sherry, thank you for sending me 50 stars. I appreciate that very, very much. All right, let's go over to YouTube. See what's happening over there real quick. Lisa says, I have a friend who has four ureters too. Elizabeth says, a better bladder book saved me. Absolutely the best advice you'll ever get. I pray someone else has helped like I was. Yeah, we have the we sell the better bladder book too. One of the things I like about the better bladder book is her discussion of gluten uh, because some people are gluten intolerant, but others aren't. Um, we can't go whole hog and say every IC patient has a gluten issue. That's simply not true. But, but she was the first to talk about gluten. 
Um, and that book is, where is that book? Right here. The Better Bladder Book by Wendy Cohan, who's a, who was a nurse in, in Oregon. She's moved to a different state now, but yeah. And guys, what I have, where is it? You know what this is? This is the manuscript for the new book we've all been working on for the last year on IC and chronic overlapping pain conditions. And so we're doing our final edit. You can see I've already updated the first half of it, which is why there's no yellow marks. So we are going to have a brand new book. It's called IC 101. IC 101. And um, we're also going to be reissuing our flare guide and our diet guide as IC 101 guides, as well as our medical records kit will be an IC 101 kit too. So we're going to have a real kit for you. Um, I'm really happy with this. This is... Uh, um, a, um, a second edition or third edition of a book called Patient to Patient Managing IC and Related Conditions, uh, written by Gay Sandler and Andrew Sandler. And they came to me about two years ago and uh, they had uh, updated their book, but their publisher went out of business. And then we had all the new subtype information and chronic overlapping pain. And so we've agreed to publish it on the IC network, but it's also really heavily rewritten with all the new information. I've done a massive amount of writing and editing in it. She and I have been working on it together. So hopefully, uh, so it'll be available as an ebook first, uh, and then I'll have a print book maybe in two months because we have to do the print layout. It's It looks really good. I'm really happy with it. I'm really happy with the content. I think, I think that it's going to help a lot of people. It's the biggest book I book project that I've worked on. Mary says, "Difficulty with passing loose tool. I'm forced to use Listerine suppositories." So, Mary, look at your pelvic floor, but also understand too that on. Um, you can feel like uh, you're full even when you're empty. And that's very true with the bladder uh, that, you know, sometimes patients get stuck, especially in the middle of the night, you feel full, you feel full, but when you go pee, there, there's nothing there. So you sit there and you strain and you strain and you strain. And that false sense of fullness is a sign that the bladder is really, really irritated. And you don't want to sit there and keep pushing and pushing because really, honestly, your bladder is probably empty. And, I, and that same applies kind of to the bowel. There, might, there will be moments where it will feel like there's something in your bowel that needs to come up. But if you glove up and stick your finger in there, there's nothing there. Um, that feeling like there's a foreign object stuck in your urethra, your bladder, your vagina is a muscle symptom. It's a classic symptom of tight muscles or dysfunctional muscles. Kim says, after I talked to you, I asked my doctor if there were estrogen suppositories, and I think they are helpful, but someone talked about Valium gabapentin suppositories. Uh, yeah, that's a, another compounded suppository that will help re relax muscles, but the estrogen is all about improving your skin. Hold on a sec. I'll be right back. I hear somebody. Hold on. Sorry. I thought that was somebody yelling for me and it was da my dad playing, trying to play a flute. He just bought off of <laughs> it's like, <gasps> I thought somebody had fallen and they were yelling for me. Katie says, is it bad to have white flakes in your pee? Well, it's definitely unusual. I mean, that usually means that your bladder walls kind of sloughing off a little bit. Definitely let your doctor know. Catherine, you can definitely have low estrogen at 38. Some have it much younger. You might ask about a compounded bioidentical. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. All right, guys. Well, listen, um, last call for questions. Last call for questions. It's about 4.30 here. Otherwise, otherwise, you will see me next Sunday, but I may do a drop-in meeting uh, during the week. We'll see.
trying to get the book done. So I got all my big, pro I got almost all of my big projects done. So the magazine is done. The book is basically done. Uh, uh, I've got to redo the flare guide, redo the diet guide, reskin everything. And I'm always throwing out new articles. Uh, we've got the COVID study going on on our website. For anybody who's had IC and COVID, please go over there and fill that out. Uh, we have the uh, Elmeron study. Uh, we're still collecting data on that. Uh, we have over 2,000 patients in, in that study alone, uh, which is very exciting. And so, um, and if there's anything you'd like to see me cover, you know, pop me an email, icnetwork at mac.com, icnetwork at mac.com. So, a uh, whole lot of sex. So, for those of you who stuck around, let's do a let's do a giveaway. So, I know I've given somebody a book. If she emailed me her e mailing address, icnetwork at mac.com, and then I've got Cisto Men. So let's see. Oh, I only have one of these. I need that. All right. Here you go. We will give one bottle of Cisto Mand away and one bottle of Cisto Protec away. Obviously, they are very similar. Cisto uh, Protec is the older formula. Cisto Mand is the new formula. This is $49. This is $43. Um, uh, they're both extremely viable. So email me, icnetwork at mac.com, icnetwork at mac.com. And I tell you what, why don't you uh, let me know if you would like either one, you give got to give the product name. And um, I want to hear your best flare management tip. Whoever gives me their best flare management tip uh, is, is going to get freebies. All right. So if you want a free bottle of Cisto Protect, a free bottle of Cisto Mend, icnetwork at mac.com is my email address. Uh, you have to email it to me, Kim. icnetwork at mac.com. And I agree. That's a, that's a good tip. I won't say what it is, uh, but I completely agree with you. I used to do that a lot too. All right, my friends. Happy New Year 2021 is going to be a great year in the IC world. Uh, next 10 days are going to be interesting, but we are going to get through this. Please mask up, stay safe. We know that COVID is affecting the bladder in quite a few people. So even, even if you don't believe in using masks, if you don't want to have a bad bladder flare, I encourage you to please, please wear your mask when you're out. Be safe, my friends. All right. Thank you, Andy. And if you found this helpful, please come on over to our website icnetwork.org and uh, you can uh, uh, become a member uh, which would help which would help us tremendously or make a donation but you know this is free happy to do it I'm a support group leader first and first and I'm happy to take your questions all right everybody be well thank you Debbie Al the good state of Alabama Thank you, Annie. Thank you very, very much. Y'all be well. All right. Facebook is turned off. YouTube. Last call, YouTube. Anything? No. Uh, let's see. Whoops. Nope. All right, my friends. You have a good one. I'll see you later.